Good afternoon, everyone. It is so good to see you here. Uh, you can remember, or I hope you remember, last spring when we were uh, having our hearings, we had some discussion of pollinators, and it was a very brief one because we were in such a rush to get the budget done. But at that time, uh, I promised we would uh, bring folks back to have a longer time so we could have a good understanding uh, of what is going on. And so that's the meeting uh, this afternoon. We have uh, a time for public testimony. We put the uh, agenda out early. So if people wanted to sign up, they could. Uh, but if people in the audience have not signed up and would like to testify, uh, you are welcome, more than welcome. Uh, we want to hear from the public on this uh, topic. Uh, with that, uh, I would take a motion on the minutes. Representative Hansen. I'd move the minutes for April 9th, October 7th, and October 8th. I see no questions. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? The minutes are approved. With that, we will begin the formal part of our hearing uh, with uh, Dr. Marla Spivak uh, from the University of Minnesota. I, as she is coming up, I just would note that there is a public testimony uh, sign-up sheet up front if people would like to do that. It is not required. If, if you're inspired at the end, you can still testify. Dr. Spivak, welcome to the committee. Thank it's you. It's to you that I made the promise, and so I yes. <laughs> just want to make sure we kept it. Thank you, Chair Wagenius. I really, really appreciate this opportunity, and thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, my assignment was to talk about honeybees and habitat, but I'm going to begin talking about the pollinator habitat bill and my uh, sincere appreciation to uh, Representative Wagenius and Torkelson and everybody else that was um, instrumental in getting the pollinator habitat bill passed in Minnesota. This is really, really great. Um, I want to acknowledge that through this bill and with the um, administration of the Department of Ag, a number of state agencies and people from the university have come together to work on this. And um, we've, we're realizing, and I've listed them off here, they're on your sheet, we've realized how much work we're already doing in the state of Minnesota, uh, indirectly or directly to help pollinators. And now with this bill, we'll, we'll be able to consolidate our efforts and enhance them. And so I think you'll be hearing today about all the efforts from the DNR with their plant database and their prairie conservation, especially for moths and butterflies with Bob Dana, um, <coughs> the DOT, the NRCS, and the Farm Service Agency with their initiatives, especially a new uh, federal initiative to put habitat on the ground in the upper Midwest, pollinator habitat, Bowser, Department of Ag, and many, many others that you'll be hearing about. So. Um, this is really a great opportunity. So a few facts, I'd like to go through this fairly quickly because I really want to make sure everybody has time. These are pollinator facts. 70, 80% of all of our flowering plants rely on animal pollinators. Insects and others will be hearing about those. 35% um, of our crops are dependent on animal pollination, but bees of these animals are the most important for crop pollination. I will be mostly talking about honeybees. They're an introduced species. Honeybees are not native to the United States or the North or South America. They were introduced in the 1600s. Highly social animals, <laughs> insects. They're the only bee that really produces a lot of honey in excess that we can harvest. So that's why they've been introduced worldwide. There are many species of native bees that you'll hear about next from Elaine Evans. In Minnesota, we estimate that we have somewhere between 325 to 400 species of native bees that are, or wild bees that are extremely important also. But I'm gonna go back to the honeybees. Um, of all the crop species globally, 
um, that provide the majority of our food, 71 are bee pollinated. And it turns out mostly by wild bees because in many other parts of the world, they don't manage honeybees as intensely as we do here for crop pollination. But in the United States, you want me to speak louder? Okay. In the United States, the value, the estimated value of pollination of food crops uh, by honeybees alone is somewhere between 15 and 18 billion, and by wild bees, approximately 3 billion. Very hard estimate to get on the wild bees. So in general, what I'm saying, and this was a photograph taken in a Whole Foods store in Maine for their marketing purposes, this is your life, this is our life with bees, and this is our life without bees. So bees are extremely important pollinators of our fruits and vegetables and, and, and flowers and other things in our diet. And bees, honeybees, have actually been in decline since World War II. This is a graph of the decline of honeybees since 1945. We had about 4.5 million colonies, hives of bees in the United States estimated at that time. This graph goes to 2007. At that point, we had an estimated 2 to 2.5 million hives of bees in the United States. They took a big dip in the 80s when a parasitic mite was introduced, and I'll talk about that. And then in 2006, 2007, that winter, a big, there was a big crash in the honeybee population throughout the United States. It was called CCD, or Colony Collapse Disorder. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit more also. Since 2007, here are the annual losses of honeybee colonies throughout the United States. This includes backyard beekeepers, sideliner beekeepers, and commercial beekeepers. Everyone is taking, on average, a 30% loss of beehives every year. That's really an unsustainable loss. Now, beekeepers, when they lose 30% of their colonies, they have to replace their losses somehow. And they can do this by either splitting their colonies into the surviving colonies and putting in a new queen. There is an active uh, industry, nurse, I'll call it a nursery industry that raises more bees and queens for people. But actually, if you have more questions, I'll let you talk to Steve Ellis, who is a commercial beekeeper, and he's one of those that struggles and struggles to re replace losses every year. We need to keep at least 2.5 million hives of bees in the United States for all the pollination contracts. So this graph, the states in yellow, indicate the highest honey producing states in the nation. And you'll notice that Minnesota is right there in the upper, in the upper Midwest. It's all, it comes in as number five in the nation in terms of honey production almost yearly. This is going down. This summer was particularly bad in honey production. And I also, with this map, I want to show with the arrows and all the little fruits and bees and things on here, what beekeepers do. So commercial beekeepers in Minnesota uh, keep their bees in Minnesota for the summer months to produce honey. And then they move them out of the state for the winter. They either move them down south to raise queen bees and nursery stock for, to replace their losses and to sell to other beekeepers. Many, many beekeepers, in fact, throughout the United States, move their bees into the almond orchards to satisfy the almond pollination contract. So there's 800, thousand acres of almonds and every acre of almond require one or two colonies per acre to pollinate that crop. So that's 1.6 million hives of bees need to be moved over into California to pollinate that crop when it blooms at the end of February, early March. So many of the bee colonies, in fact, arrows should come from every state over into California. And then you can see other fruits and vegetables that beekeepers are moving their bees to to pollinate. So when you talk about Minnesota and the value of bees to Minnesota, you can't really get a good enough estimate because bees are moved nationally or they're contributing to national pollination services. So anything that happens in Minnesota for honey production, those bees then go on to satisfy pollination contracts so that we can all eat. Bees are dying from multiple causes and interacting causes, and I'll explain it today as the interacting peas. This came from Jeff Pettis, who's the research leader at a USDA bee research facility. Um, he called it poor nutrition, interacting with pathogens and parasites and pesticides. 
So I want to focus a little bit on bee nutrition because that's the habitat question that we're here to address. Bees get all of their nutrition from flowers. They're different from wasps. Elaine will explain that a little bit next. Bees get all of their nutrition from flowers, all of their protein from pollen, all of their carbohydrate comes all of their carbohydrate requirements come from nectar and they need water. And in the process of going to eat, they end up pollinating because the pollen is the male sperm of the flower. The bees pick it up for protein. They have very fuzzy bodies. They carry it from flower to flower as they go eating and the pollen is deposited back on the female part of another flower for pollination. Bees need many, many, many flowers to make up one pound of honey. Now this says two million flowers to make one pound of honey, and I really don't know if that's true, but the point is they need lots of flowers to make just one pound of honey. And if you winter a honeybee colony here in Minnesota, the bees need 75 pounds, up to 100 pounds of honey just to survive a winter here in Minnesota. So the bees are outside in those that stayed here, hobby beekeepers, university bees and others that stayed here for the winter, those bees are huddled in the nest right now in their colonies and they're shivering to keep warm and they're eating the honey they stored over the summer, that hopefully they stored over the summer. On a visiting, on one foraging trip, a bee can visit 50 to 100 flowers, usually of the same species. That's why honeybees are such good pollinators because they stay on the same species of flower on one trip. They need lots of pollen, lots of protein, at least 50 pounds of protein per colony over the season, and they need diverse sources of pollen to satisfy their dietary requirements they, to get all of their amino acids. They're essential you know, amino acids just like we do. So this is the situation in many parts of Minnesota, sadly, for bees. From the bees' perspective, there's just a lack of nectar and pollen producing flowers. Corn, of course, is wind pollinated. It has a lot of pollen, but the protein content in corn is very, very low. Soybeans in Minnesota do not produce any resources. Maybe in southern Minnesota toward Albert Lee, on occasion on a hot and humid summer, the soybeans may secrete nectar. But for the most part in Minnesota, as far as we know, the soybeans are not providing any nutrition for the bees. Our roadsides are mowed, and if not mowed, they're sprayed, which is very disturbing to many beekeepers who drive down the road and see their income, their honey crop being mowed down or sprayed down. And then alfalfa, which is also a very good honey, crop, honey plant, is now cut before bloom to increase the value, the protein value of the hay. And it used to be when it would, was left to bloom to 10 to 20%, it would provide a very good floral source for the bees. We have a lot of expiring CRP land, set aside land, not so much in Minnesota, the darker colors indicate expiring CRP land, but in many locations, the amount of land available, flowering habitat for, for bees and our other pollinators is expiring. So traditional honey plants and pollen plants in Minnesota are these. Clover, many species, and they're all introduced. Basswood, both our uh, native, Tilia americana, our native basswood, and our introduced lindens that are found in the city. Alfalfa, buckwheat, and now more of canola crop. Sunflower asters, and what I'll call wildflowers, which are flowers to bees and weeds to many other people. So flowering plants. The best honey and pollen plant in Minnesota traditionally was mellow lotus, yellow and white sweet clover. And this is now considered by some to be an invasive species and we're trying to eliminate clover. So on top of everything, just our land use practices and the elimination of this honey plant, the bees are really suffering in their honey production. I'm gonna come back to solutions at the end uh, I want to go on to pathogens and parasites very briefly. The main pest of honeybees, the worst enemy of honeybees is this mite. Mites are like ticks, they suck bees' blood. This is an obligate parasite on bees. It can only live on honeybees, not the other bees, the other 400 species of native bees we have. It only lives on honeybees. It was introduced into the United States inadvertently from Asia in the 80s and it rides around, it sucks the blood of the bees, 
what you see in the top right is a developing bee inside of a, a honeycomb cell. That's a pupa. The mite feeds on the pupa and it doesn't kill the pupa, but it reduces the bee's lifespan. When that bee emerges as an adult bee, it will not live as long. That bee's immune system will be compromised and the mites move the uh, viruses around. So bees have latent viruses that are usually not a problem, but when the mite starts feeding, it picks up viral particles, they amplify within the bee's body, they move them around from bee to bee as they feed, and viruses become a huge problem. This pest has been extremely, extremely difficult, the mites, for beekeepers to control because mites and insects are very closely related. So what do you put in a bee colony to kill the mite and not the bee and that will not contaminate honey? This has been an extremely difficult problem for beekeepers. Bees have other diseases. I don't need to go into detail, but just to tell you, it's not just the mites, they have other diseases that and those combined, when the bees are not well nourished, of course the disease problem can become worse. The pesticide issue, I, I'm sure we're gonna cover a little bit later. I just wanna say very briefly that since bees started dying in mass in the winter of 2006, 2007, Bee, keep, uh, bee researchers, particularly at Penn State University, started doing surveys, pesticide residue analysis of what honeybees were bringing back to the colony. These bees, you can see some, two of them have little orange balls on, the, on their back legs. That's the pollen that they're taking home as food. So the researchers dislodged that pollen and they subject it to pesticide residue analysis and found that honeybees on average have six detectable pesticide residues in every pollen load they carry home as food. This is every class of insecticide. This is fungicides, herbicides, and adjuvants. And I'm gonna talk about these adjuvants a little bit more. So this, we talk a lot about the neonicotinoids and I, they are a problem. And I, Dr. Vera Krishik and Steve Ellis, I'm sure will bring them up as well as others. I just wanna point out that that's not the only culprit. We have many culprits. We have lots of insecticides out there that bees encounter. The fungicides uh, we're learning are more of a problem than we thought. Herbicides probably don't directly affect the bee, but they do kill off the weedy plants, the flowering plants that bees are using as food. The adjuvants are inert ingredients that are part of a pesticide formulation that are not labeled. And many of these inert ingredients can be more toxic than the active ingredient, particularly if they're organosilicones. So they add organosilicone as an additive to an insecticide mix because it helps penetrate the leaf cuticle more. It also penetrates the insect cuticle and so it's very lethal to insects in general. Okay, so I wanna give three research examples about how all of these things are are combining. This is all really relatively new research and actually all of it comes from, these three examples I chose come from Europe where they're also having problems with the bees. One of them that just came out by an Italian group of researchers looked at the effects of clothianidin. This is one of the neonicotinoid insecticides. They used very, very small doses, 0.1 parts per billion that they would uh, Infect or inoculate one bee with very, very low dose. And they looked at the metabolic pathway. What happens when you give a bee a very, very, very small dose of this neonicotinoid compound? What happens metabolically to the bee? And what they found, and the way I'll explain it, is the immune system in a bee, and ours also, is gated. In other words, it's not always being expressed because then we'd have autoimmune disorders. So the immune system is gated. When, with a very, very small dose of clothianidin, the immune system was not opened up, it was not expressed. And so it, the, the proteins that were, um, they were downregulated, so they were not being able to be expressed, and that meant that the viral loads in the bees would increase very high. So beekeepers, we've been wondering why it is that even when beekeepers control the mites, 
the viral loads in bees are always so high. And this could be one reason is that chronic, very sublethal doses of a, ne in this case, neonicotinoid is affecting the immune system in such a way where it cannot fight off the viruses. That's one example of these interactions that we never expected but we're finding. Another one are these adjuvants. This was a recent one uh, from California, actually, in the almond orchards. This was done by Dr. Reed Johnson at Ohio State. Actually, this is a US study. They found that uh, the beekeepers were trying to raise queen bees in California while the almonds were in bloom. This is always how they do it. The almond growers spray a fungicide, pristine, on the almonds while they're in bloom. The beekeepers noticed that while they were growing, while they were trying to raise queens during this time, all the queen bee larvae were dying. And so they called Dr. Johnson out who looked at Christine, the fungicide, and found actually that was not what was causing the, the queen bee larvae to die. It was something else. And because California has public pesticide records, anybody can go online and see what was used where it was used, how much, what compounds, and all this detailed information. So he was able to go into the public record. This is something Minnesota does not have that I would recommend that we would have, if possible. But um, you're welcome, Steve. He didn't pay me. <laughs> um, what the he, Dr. Johnson went into the pesticide records and found that in fact, during the time that pristine was being applied, the Almond growers were using dimelin, which is an insect growth regulator. It really highly disruptive to the insects and it, they would not allow the queen bee to develop fully. He also found at the same time that 20% of the almond growers were adding two different insecticides into their tank mix. So that it was the pristine plus dimelin plus two insecticides. And one of the insecticides, he tried both of them individually on bees, was not very toxic, but the other one was highly toxic. And then he looked at the combination between dimelin and this other insecticide and found a synergy, which means both together, they're more toxic than each one individually. So it wasn't the pristine, it was the tank mixes. And after he gave this talk recently in, I was just in California at their state beekeeping meeting where there are a lot of almond growers that attend, they, pretty, they had no idea. They came up to him and I think that just because of the public records and the research that was done, that they'll probably, I hope, stop the use of dimelin and that one insecticide, especially when the almonds are in bloom. And finally, there's been studies on what happens when bees don't have good nutrition, when they only have access to one kind of protein, one source of pollen in their diet. And it really leads to deficient immune system functioning and it leads to increased diseases and in the Nosema disease, which is a gut parasite and viruses. So these are examples of these interactions, what's hitting the bees. It's not one cause of bee death, it's many interactions and mon many of them are hidden that we'll be revealing as the research goes on. So what to do? Uh, we need to plant more bee-friendly flowers, which is what we're here today to do, and that's what the pollinator habitat bill will do and is doing. And at the same time, we need to uh, avoid pesticide contamination. So if we're planting flowers for bees, we have to make sure that they're not contaminated with pesticides. There will be a big push for native plants, native flowers. This is gonna be excellent for our, for many, many things. It will be excellent for our native bees. It'll be great for wildlife, for quail, for pheasants, and hunting in hunting wildlife, for our birds, for our monarchs. The question is, will native flowers be good honey producers for the honeybees? This is a research question that we need to address. We cannot assume that just planting native plants will be good for honeybees. We can't assume that. There are a number of them, I'm sorry, there are a number of native plants that probably will be very good for honey production if they're planted in sufficient abundance and density. But at this point, they're not. And I would think that most beekeepers will not make a honey crop from a native or a restored prairie, unfortunately, especially how they're planted now. Hopefully in the future, if we can get enough flowers in there, they will produce a honey crop. But it would be nice to identify particular natives 
native flowers that would be really good substitutes for clover if we're going to eliminate clover. Cover crops would be awesome, would be great plants for bees, for native bees, for butterflies, for our honeybees. They're great for oil seeds, some of them, and for soil fertility. We need to pay particular attention when we put in a cover crop that that flowering crop will not take up any pesticide residue that may be bound up or in the soil, that it may not take up any pesticides that to then later be toxic to bees. So cover crops are excellent, but we need to proceed with caution and with some more research and residue analysis. We need to be very careful about protecting our bees from pesticide kills. Basically, if there's flowers blooming, bees are foraging on them. That's just how it works. So I go around and my technician, Gary Reuter, who's here, has gone around to lots of pesticide applicator training workshops. Um, thanks to Dean Hertzfeld, he's put this up to all of these. <laughs> We go around educating pesticide applicators on how they can help protect our pollinators. With this list of things, this is just cutting to the chase, by choosing pesticides with low toxicity and low residue, not spraying while bees are foraging, which is during the day, do not allow the spray to drift on blooming plants, apply in early evening or in the evening or early morning, that's when bees are not flying, so these are ways to use pesticides uh, judiciously and to raise awareness about the chronic exposure to our bees, our moths, our butterflies, all of our beneficial insects to chronic exposure of the neonicotinoids, which is in many of our plants. So I'm going to stop there and I will take questions maybe. Yes. Okay. We, I appreciate uh, the breadth of, of what we have heard, and it is a lot, but we learn oftentimes from questions as much as we do from presentations. So members, questions? Uh, Representative McNamara. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Dr. Spavik. Um, my question is in regards to McNamara. My question is in regards to uh, sweet clover. Um, it, it's considered in, in restored prairie that it's an invasive. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Do you think we should be leaving that alone? I mean, I specifically have had people say it's, and I know it's good for bees. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Madam Chair, uh, Representative McNamara, Representative? Yeah, thank you. My, my, feeling, whoops, my feeling is that we should keep the non-native plants out of our prairies, out of our restored prairies, anywhere where we want native plants to be I don't think those are places for clover. I, there are other places where planting clover is entirely appropriate. Roadsides would be good at, uh, and a good example of that. Um, cover crops, um, power line um, corridors would be great places for those. But places where we're trying to restore and conserve native habitat, clover is probably not the best thing. It is a non-native species. And just w one quick follow-up. Could you just say a couple of uh, flowering varieties, uh, forbs, that you would recommend of high value uh, in bees and maybe different uh, flower times of the year? Madam Chair, I wish I would have brought that slide. Uh, Representative McNamara, yes, there's um, a penstemon that blooms early. There's things like mountain mint. There's um, milkweeds and monarda that are very good. There's anise hyssop. Many of the native plants in the mint family are extremely good. Later on, there would be asters, um, sunflowers, goldenrod, and what am I missing? <laughs> There's, that was pretty good. There are a number of them that we're researching now. In fact, I have some funding from General Mills, who is very interested in this particular question. And, and one final, last one, Madam Chair. Um, in the uh, nursery tree business, um, uh, you talked about how to, to manage the times you spray and stuff. What about the value of things like flowering crab in, in, a, in like a nursery setting? Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. Yes, trees are very, trees and shrub, flowering trees and shrubs are very good pollinator um, habitat because mm -hmm. you, we talk about acres, linear acres, but when you have a tree, you get, it's vertical. 
So you can get lots of flowers on a tree or a shrub, much more than you can get from planting, you know, even a roadside. So flowering crabs, even the, um, the early flowering trees like oak and maple are very, and uh, willow especially, are very, very good pollen sources for bees. Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Dr. Spivak, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, we provided appropriations last year, or the last spring, and some direction, and I'm wondering about collaboration with our surrounding states, or even California, if, if the bee trade is moving around, and I know you're well known in the, in the research community, just maybe a little bit about how are we working with the other states and, and uh, complementing each other so we're trying to fill in the, the data gaps. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, in fact, we have some research, um, and Elaine Evans, who's a graduate student who will speak next, her whole PhD is on pollinator habitat and what's going on with the native bees in North Dakota in the prairie pothole region. We have a lot of good collaborations with the USGS and the beekeepers in North Dakota. Um, California, we're, I'm not working with directly, but the, when we go to a, when I go to a beekeeper meeting, it's they're pretty much national, and so we all know what's going on um, in most of the states. So there is a lot of collaboration among bee researchers, but among state agencies, they don't tend to cross this you know the state boundary. But I think particularly with pollinator habitat, I think everybody's paying attention to what each other's doing. NRCS in particular is a federal you know, program, so they're certainly paying attention. I hope I Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Dr. Spivak, welcome, glad to have you here. Um, could you talk a little bit about folks who maybe go to their local nursery and buy what they think are bee-friendly plants, mm -hmm. bring them home and plant them, uh, but these plants have been treated uh, that may be, you know, have a negative impact? Madam Chair and Representative Tarkelson, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna leave a lot of that to Dr. Vera Krishik, who will talk about this. But yes, it's a, a, a extreme concern because many of the nursery plants have been pre-treated in the soil with one of the neonicotinoid insecticides. And it's just this hidden thing. You go to the store to buy a plant for bees and you don't know that it may already be treated and you go to your nursery and you ask has it been treated and they probably don't know. <laughs> Representative Anderson. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Very interesting. Doctor, you talked about uh, the flowering plants and a lot of crops globally that are pollinated by bees. I, I just have to ask the question, and heaven forbid this, but if, if bees were not here, Almonds, for example, is there no other way these plants could pollinate? Madam Chair, so some plants are more dependent on animal or insect pollination than others. Almonds is one of those where it's almost uh, very, very highly dependent on bee pollination. So we say no bees, no nuts, you know. Coffee, for example, which is not local, but coffee increases the yield. The yield is increased 30, 40 percent if you put honeybees in a coffee plantation. So we would have fruits and vegetables, but they wouldn't be of the high, high quality or texture or taste or market value. And, you know, the worst case scenario, we're all eating grain and gruel, <laughs> which is pretty extreme. But, um, yeah, really the insect pollination really contributes to the quality of and the market value of the fruits and vegetables and of our seed that we use to plant more fruits and vegetables and flowers. Thanks, one just a follow-up question. How long has the this mite been around? Is that relatively new or has it been around for forever? Madam Chair, this Varroa mite has, was introduced in the United States in 1987. So it's been here for a while. Um, the beekeeping industry is small. 
so the chemical companies were not really interested in um, providing a lot of different compounds for the beekeepers to put in their colonies to treat the mites. So they got one, a synthetic pyrethroid, the mites developed resistance to that. They registered an organophosphate to put in a bee colony, the mites developed resistance to that. Just one after not, not in, you know, instead of the IPM, we're giving multiple choices. There was one thing registered after another. So it was just a recipe for disaster, really. Now there are certain compounds that are considered organic. Um, they're pretty harsh, but they're organic. Formic acid um, and others, thymol, they're pretty harsh, but they're not as effective as controlling the mites. So it's, it's a tough problem. Let me follow up on Representative Anderson's question about what is and isn't pollinated um, by natives or honeybees. Right. Uh, we talk about almonds, but not everybody eats almonds. But my guess is around this table, everybody eats tomatoes or green peppers or cucumbers. Some of these common things that we eat, can you, are they all, any of them self pollinating or are they all need a pollinator? Most of the fruit, Madam Chair, most of the fruits and vegetables that we eat do require insect pollination. Um, okay, I'm going to have to look over here. What fruit or vegetable? <laughs> this is a quiz question. You got, does not require insect pollination. Can you come up with one, Elaine? Tomatoes or Heather? are self-pollinated. Well, tomatoes are pollinated by bumblebees. So they can be self-pollinated, but the quality of the tomato, when you have a bumblebee buzz pollinating a tomato, the tomatoes are much better tasting. Even a self-fruitful one, since people are talking about, to get a qualitative and quantitative but we'll, uh, better. I'm sorry. Let's let's have that when you just Okay, up, I'm sorry. Do want to really, I can't come up with on offhand um, fruits and vegetables that you eat routinely that are not bee pollinated. Would not be pollinated. Yeah. Okay. Some of the peppers, I guess, but the, the bumblebees are probably buzz pollinated. And we have native bumblebees to boot. That yes, we have native bumblebees. Okay. Uh, Representative Torkelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, could you, Dr. Spivak, could you talk a little more about the relationship between honeybees and native pollinators? Are they complementary or do they uh, fight or? <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, yeah. Uh, thank you. So, Actually, when bumblebees and native bees get together on a crop, this has been shown in research for sunflowers and other uh, fruits and vegetable crops, that they increase pollination efficiency. In just the way they forage and the way they move across from flower to flower, or down a row or across a row, and how they get into the pollen, they end up, they're very, very complementary in increasing pollination together. And sometimes you'll see a honeybee displacing a native bee from a flower, but the real question is, do they displace them to the point where they can't get enough food for their own lives, for the native bee's lives? And the literature shows that that is very rare, very rarely happens. I suppose if you really swamped an area with honeybee colonies, it can affect um, some bumblebee colonies, for example, and Elaine Evans has some um, evidence about this, but in most cases, the native bees and the honeybees get along fine, and they're complementary, especially in their pollination practices. Well, thank you for this testimony. We truly appreciate it, and we look forward to uh, having the next testifier, Elaine Evans, who works with you. Thank you, Madam thank Chair, you. and everybody. Welcome to the committee. And just put your name on the record, if you would. Yes, thank you, Madam Greenness. My name is Elaine Evans. Behind my talk here. Oh, is it there? Okay, thank you for having me here and thank you to everyone. I'm here to talk to you today about bees other than, than honeybees. So we've got a lot of different bees in Minnesota and I'm gonna talk about some of their habitat needs. Oops, let's see. 
how to do this. Oh, Aaron. <laughs> Members, you will okay. note these are all in our packets. Uh, staff was very efficient in uh, getting this all together for us. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. So I'd like to take a second to just talk about what bees are before I get into more detailed information about them. So bees are basically a specialized lineage of wasps. Um, wasps mostly use insect prey to feed their young, but all bees have switched away from that habit to instead use pollen and nectar that they gather from flowers to feed their young. In terms of what bees we have in Minnesota, there's a recent film that was called More Than Honey. What we have in Minnesota is more than honey bees. So honey bees are just one species of bee. There's six different families, about 43 different genera. And Marla mentioned um, we don't have an exact number here, but somewhere between 350 and 400 is a guess for how many different bee species we have here. So the honeybee is, as Marla mentioned, it's not native, it's imported here, and um, for the most part, the populations are all managed by people. For the, all the other bees, there are also a few of these um, wild bees that are not native, that have you know, made their way to Minnesota, and a few of them that are managed by people for, for pollination. But for the most part, um, these bees are all native to Minnesota, and they're all wild, meaning that they're just living out there in the wild. Their populations aren't being managed by people. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about the, the diversity of bees, and so I just wanna mention uh, why this diversity is important to us. So when we have diverse bee species in Minnesota, they'll be providing diverse pollination services, and that's gonna be supporting diverse wildlife habitat. I have a couple slides here just to give you an overview of some of the, the variety of, of bees that we have here. Um, they come in a lot of different shapes and sizes and colors, and um, some of them are, are amazingly beautiful creatures. There's some bright metallic ones, um, lots of stripes, lots of different colors, lots of different sizes that um, enable them to, to pollinate a wide variety of different flowers. I'm gonna talk next about bee decline, what we know about what's happening with wild bees. Marlon gave a lot of information about honeybees, which we, we um, have good information about what's happening with them. For all of these other bees, um, the information is not as, as thorough. We're dealing with so many different species. There's 20,000 different species of bees worldwide. But there have been some studies looking at comparing the number of species. So when I talk about species richness, that's a measure of just the number of species that are in an area. And there was a study that compared the number of bee species that they found in areas, um, they compared pre-1980 and post-1980, and they found severe declines. These studies were in Britain and the Netherlands. Over 50% of the bee species were missing um, post-1980. There was a more recent study that revisited some of these same methods in some of the same areas. And the, the charts that you have here, what I want you to notice on those charts is the, the line that goes across there. That's showing change in the number of species. So if, there's, if there are dots below that line, that means that there were declines in the number of species. And if there's a, the dots above that line, that means that the number of species were increasing. So this recent study that visited these areas, when they were comparing the number of bee species in the 50s and 60s compared to the 70s and 80s, that's the, the chart that's on the top there, you'll notice most of the dots are below the line. So for, for the vast majority of, of the different pollinator species they were looking at, things were in the decline. They also then compared what was happening in the 70s and 80s versus the 90s and into the aughts. And one difference that was happening there is in the 90s in, in Europe, they started doing a lot of, they call them agri-environmental agri schemes. So a lot of it is, is what we're talking about doing here with pollinator habitat. They started doing a lot with planting for, for wildlife around their agricultural areas. And you'll notice that in the, the chart that's down below there, there are, um, the line, the dots are a lot closer to um, 
to the line that's going across the middle, there's some dots that are above that line. So that means that some groups of pollinators were increasing in species number. And the ones that are below the line, they're decreasing, but they're decreasing less. So th this study is showing that um, doing these kind of things that we're talking about doing in terms of getting habitat in there for pollinators can really help to increase the number of bee species that are able to survive in these areas. In terms of what's happening in the U.S. with, with um, similar studies, there was a study that was done in Illinois and they looked at um, collections that were done in the 1890s and comparing them to more present day. And they found similar levels of decline, about 50% decline in, in bee species. There was a recent study, um, a master's thesis by Joel Gardner, who is who's here with us today in the audience. He's a, a student at the University of Minnesota. And he was doing comparisons at Itasca State Park. And he compared collections we have from 1930 and 37 and 38 with more present day. And um, there were 11 different species. So he was working with just one group of bees, the leafcutter bees, um, which is a, a family of bees. And so there were 11 different species in that family that he didn't rediscover. There were a few species that he found that, that weren't found in the 30s um, also. And I want to mention that this research was supported by the, the Minnesota DNR in their efforts to help us learn more about what we have for um, native bees in Minnesota. In looking in some of the, the, the more detail of what was happening with these two studies, I have these a couple charts here. And these charts are uh, using species accumulation curves. And this is a tool that ecologists use when we're studying bees in an area to make estimates about what we would find there. When we're going and collecting bees from an area, we, we, it, it would be impossible for us to collect every bee to really know what's really there. And we wouldn't want to collect every bee because we want to leave the populations there. So the species accumulation curves are a tool that we use to estimate if we did increase the number of collections, how many more species would we find? And those lines have errors around them. So, so with both of these charts, there's a, a more solid line and then there's other lines around it that show the, the error around that. And the study in Illinois was done, they were revisiting habitat that had been um, pretty severely degraded. And so when they're comparing these lines of, of the numbers of species that they're finding compared 1916 to 2009, those two lines are really different, so showing that there was a clear evidence for a decline in that area in terms of the number of bee species that they were finding. The study that was done in Minnesota at Itasca State Park, these lines are closer together between 1937 and 2012. And if the, the lighter lines that show the error, you see that these lines overlap. So that means that in terms of statistically comparing these populations, we can't say that there's a real difference. And what this is possibly indicating is that having a, a protected area like a state park helped with the preservation of bee habitat and helped preserve bee species. For all of these different bee species, the group that we know the most about for the decline worldwide, and, and it's true in Minnesota too, are our bumblebees. There's been um, evidence of severe range shifting um, and decline and range shrinking for several species of bumblebees, um, Bombus athenis, Bombus turricola, and Bombus ashtoni. And, um, there are several other bumblebee species that there's good evidence for their populations declining in other parts of, um, of North America. We're starting to get some evidence of some decline here in Minnesota, but we, we are still kind of figuring out what's happening. And this work was done uh, mostly by the Xerxes Society. I was working um, for them for a few years, gathering information about what we know about the population um, and, and you know, where these bees are occurring. And one of the things that I found out was that um, we're really missing a lot of long-term survey information and a lot of different geographical areas to know 
what are happening, you know, what's really happening with bumblebees. So in 2007, I decided that one way to solve that is to start just doing a long-term survey myself. So I started in 2007. I've been surveying at seven different Twin Cities parks. I've recorded over 2,000 different bumblebees with the help of, of volunteers. Um, that's one of the really fun things about this is I get to, to get the public out there with me and get them engaged in, in finding out what's happening with bees. And if, another exciting thing that happened here is um, this Bombus athenus, which I hadn't seen since the late 90s. Um, I started seeing them in 2010 at two different sites in the Twin Cities. So um, this is one of these declining bumblebees that um, they're not, definitely not present in the numbers that they used to be, but they are still here. They are still hanging on in, in remnant ha habitats. And I'm also starting to, to get evidence of what's happening with some of these other species in terms of their populations. And I'm unfortunately seeing some severe declines in some other species. For Minnesota and conservation bee measures that are, that are happening currently, the DNR has a strong interest in addressing these concerns about native bees in Minnesota, but we're really lacking a thorough knowledge. So, you know, like my bumblebee surveys, that's just me and I can only go as far as I can go, which is I'm sticking mostly around the Twin Cities. Um, I haven't been able to gather information from the whole state about what's happening, and that's just one bee group. There's all these other species of bees, and um, we really need to have a thorough information thorough information about what's happening with all these different species before we can um, address conservation concerns. Um, we have started working the University of Minnesota with the DNR to, to look at potential bee species for their species that are in greatest need of um, conservation for their, for their list for Minnesota. For these wild bees and figuring out what we can do for them, um, flowers, again, is something that's re really important, food. But for these bees, I mentioned they're, they're not managed, they're living out in, there in the wild, they need nesting habitat too. So besides just thinking about flowers for them, we need to think about where they're living and what they need. And also, pesticides are also affecting these. Marla gave good information about um, thinking about not just providing this habitat, but then what's happening in this habitat in terms of for, for providing resources there for them. We don't want to then uh, track them to these areas and then have them be exposed to, to um, toxic chemicals that would, would then um, kill them. For food for these, for these um, wild bees, they really need a diversity of, of native and, and non-native plants can also provide good food sources for them. They need, just need abundant nectar and pollen. It's best to plan for having things blooming throughout the year, especially early and late, which are critical times for, for a lot of different bee species. For special concerns for these wild, wild bees, um, the foraging range of these bees varies with the different bee species. So when you have smaller bees, they have much smaller foraging ranges. And with the variety of different bee species, these, for, these ranges for, for where they'll go to gather food and, and materials for nesting varies from about a quarter mile to up to two miles. And so something like the, the the um, prairie conservation plan that the DNR is working on, where they're working on getting corridors between prairie areas will really help these bees to, to move around to get to where they, they need to be. Diet breadth is something that's really different with the wild bees too. Um, Honeybees and, and some of our native bees are generalist foragers, meaning that they'll visit a wide variety of plants to, to get their food needs. We do have some of our, our native wild bees that are specialists. So that means they only visit one kind of plant or one you know, group of related plants to gather their food. An example of that is a, a little sweat bee called Duforia monarde, and they only collect pollen from monarda flowers. If they are forced to, to gather other pollen, the, the larvae, their young don't actually, aren't, aren't physiologically able to develop on these other pollens. So having a more thorough knowledge of our bees that we have and what their needs are will help us 
to really provide for that, that diversity of these species. For nesting habitat, uh, we also need to, to learn about where bees live. So for, for a bee like the honeybee, this, the picture here is an old fashioned scap that beekeepers used to use that was, um, now they're mostly in, in boxes that people provide them. But for these wild bees, they need to find nesting sites on their own. For the majority of these bees, they're ground nesting bees, so about 70% of these wild bees are nesting in the ground. So they'll dig tunnels down into the ground, they gather pollen and bring it in there and lay their eggs on it and, and make their nests under the ground. To support these bees, having areas of bare soil helps them. Things like native bunch grasses, which, which kind of plume over and they end up leaving bare soil around them, those can be really important to create these patches of bare soil for these bees. Um, sometimes just having cleared away um, slopes, the well-drained slopes, or even just piles of soil. This is another area where we're still learning about what these different bees require. So, so this is something that we can become more fine-tuned with this once we know uh, what bees we have and, and learn more about their nesting preferences. So, so we're starting out with general recommendations to, to serve the broad group. The rest of the bees, about 30% of them, are tunnel nesting. So that means that they're using holes. A lot of times they'll use um, cavities left in wood by bark beetles. They're not digging these holes out themselves. They're, they're finding holes and using them. They'll also use stems of plants and make their nests in there. And so they're doing similar things to the ground nesting bees are doing where they're gathering pollen and bringing it back into those structures. And then they'll lay their eggs and create their nests in there. For, for these bees to help them out, um, really it's about retaining that kind of habitat. So if there's dead trees that can be left in areas, if there's standing vegetation that can be left that would be appropriate for bees that are going into the stems, that's great. There's also options to provide artificial nests for these bees where you can um, create this nesting habitat for them. One uh, caveat with that is that if you leave these structures there, you can end up increasing the pests and parasites. So if you are relying on, on artificial nests to support these um, cavity nesting bees, there is some maintenance where you do need to go in and switch these nests out. Bumblebees are, are kind of a different case. They don't really fit in with the, the ground nesting bees or the tunnel nesting bees. They do nest under the ground um, and above the ground. But they're using cavities that are already there. So a lot of times when they're, when they're underground, they're using old rodent holes. Um, there's some species that prefer to nest above the ground, and so they'll be in, in clumps of grass or in clumps of brush that have been, been left there. So for them to help them out, it really helps to have undisturbed land, um, you know, leaving those materials there. Uh, similar to the tunnel nesting bees, it is possible to provide them with, with boxes and nesting material. Um, this is more of an art form and it's something that's not well refined at this point um, in terms of you really need to know where the bumblebees want to be and what exactly they want inside of this box. And there's, um, in Minnesota we have 18 different species of bumblebees and they probably all vary in terms of what they want. But um, it is something that, that is an option. Another option is that um, we are able to, to raise bumblebee species. Um, and so this, this would mostly be possible um, for, for just certain species that are adaptable to this and as kind of a, a measure to, to help support their populations if we, if we really need to. Habitat is really gonna be the best way to, to support the, the native bumblebee populations. So I'm gonna summarize with just a couple of slides about um, the, the key habitat elements for bees and then some future directions. So for all bees, the floral resources, having abundant and diverse floral resources from spring to fall is something that's really important for all the different bee species. I wanna talk a little bit about the differences um, between honeybees and the, these wild bees and what they need. So honeybees do really need these large tracts of nectar rich flowers to support them. Whereas with the wild bees, something like the, the native prairies where, where flowers might be more sparse, that does seem like the, the wild bees are, are good at using those, those sparser resources and um, 
can easily adapt to that. For ground nesting bees, having access to bare ground and undisturbed ground is gonna be important for providing nesting habitat needs for them. For the tunnel nesting bees, having access to stem and dead woods is important for them for nesting. And for bumblebees, again, undisturbed areas and um, you know things like rodent holes and, and vegetation that's left there, brush, um, can make a big difference for them to, to find places to live. For future directions and needs, um, there's a few different LCCMR proposed projects um, that one of them involves coordination of some pollinator habitat initiatives between um, you know, a lot of different groups here working in the state and um, working to identify the needs of these wild bees. A statewide survey of Minnesota bees, there's a LCCMR proposal from the DNR to survey wild bees in prairies and grassland, and that would really help us to, to refine our view of, of what the habitat needs are once we know what bees we have. In terms of then taking the ne next step to provide habitat for them, uh, Marla had mentioned my, my research and so in, in North Dakota in the prairie pothole region, and what I'm working on is looking at what's happening in the landscape and connecting that to bee diversity and abundance so that from that research we'll be able to, to make general recommendations for, for habitat needs that, um, habitat elements that can then support a diversity of, of bees. We're also um, working with the University of Minnesota and the US Geological Survey to compile a pollen library. And this is important in um, studying what these bees are using for floral resources. So we know generally providing a diversity of, of floral resources is gonna be something that's good, but if we have more information about um, what specifically these bees are using, that will, will help us greatly. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to, to take some questions. Very good testimony uh, and good work. Uh, questions from members? Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a quick, I, I glanced back at this other map on where the decline started in like the early 50s, late 50s. Does that coincide with our war on dandelions? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just seems like when I was a kid in the backyard with the dandelions, there were bees all over yeah. the place. Yeah, so that was back with the, with the decline with the honeybee populations? Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, I, be, I believe there were a lot of different things happening there. So, I mean, that, that's one thing that was happening that's important. There, there are a lot of changes in, in um, agriculture in terms of, um, of loss of habitat um, surrounding agricultural areas and um, a, a lot of increase in, in um, pesticides, pesticide use um, and different types of pesticides that were be, being used. Um, I don't know if anyone has really specified what exactly was was um, you know causing causing that, but I think those are both elements that were were involved in the decline. I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Clark. I didn't see your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. You know, um, I'm just looking at the ground. Karen, can you speak oh, okay. into the mic? Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, I've had the un unpleasant experience of uh, not, not distinguishing between a ground bee and a ground wasp. <laughs> and I'm just wondering how they, um, how they interact with each other and, you know, I mean, I guess we probably need our wasps, but it seems to me like we certainly need our bees. And um, I don't know if you could just talk about that because the ground wasps are certainly very um, difficult to live with. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Madam Greenius and um, Representative Clark. Mm. For the the differences between the the ground nesting bees and the ground nesting wasps, um, so there's a great diversity of wasps um, and a lot of different wasps that, that, that nest in the ground that, that we never interact with because they never bother us. What we're mostly familiar with for ground wasps are um, yellow jackets and social wasps that will nest underground and then you step on their nest and then you get hundreds of, of wasps coming out um, to, to defend their nest, which um, you, know, you can't really blame them for doing. But um, uh, for these ground nesting bees, 
they're solitary. They, they will sometimes be clustered together, but it's a lot of times the, the social wasps and social bees that are more involved in nest defense because they have bees that are living together defending one area. So with the, the ground nesting bees, um, you know, if you step on their nest, there's no one to come out really. <laughs> um, they're, they're not gonna be involved in, in defensive stinging is the big difference between the, the ground bees and the social ground nesting wasps. I'm glad to clear their reputation. Too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Vera, oh, mm -hmm. no, Dr. Vera Krishik? Welcome to the committee. Hmm. Um, Madam Chair, my name is Vera Krishik. I'm an entomologist in the Department of Entomology at the University of Minnesota. I specialize on landscapes, so I work with the nursery industry on giving talks on managing insect pests in landscapes. I've worked on pesticides most of my career. I teach a course on landscape IPM, how to reduce pesticide use in urban landscapes, and I teach a pesticide course. And I'm very happy to uh, do research in a state that is so proactive and interested in protecting their pollinators. So I um, really thank you for listening to us today. Uh, without pollinators, all of us are gonna be affected. It, Marla showed you some slides on how much of the fruits and vegetables we use um, depend on pollinators. So it's something that uh, everybody needs to be concerned about because it's also individual choice in, in using pesticides in your backyard. It's not just uh, agriculture or business. Uh, we all have to make choices now, and now that we understand the needs of pollinators, habitat, food, and lack of pesticides that will affect them, uh, hopefully we can change uh, the situation and increase pollinator abundance and biodiversity. So thank you very much for listening to us today. I have to start out by saying that I don't think pesticides in general are bad. I mean, for, the econo for economy, for the production of food, we need pesticides to control some pests. It's just the choice that we have in pesticides. And really what it has come down to in the last 20 years uh, since the French first identified this issue is that systemic insecticides are much worse for bees than most contact insecticides. And so that's what I'm gonna to try to talk to you about today, what the difference is, and why this certain class of insecticides has uh, reaped such a bad name and has so many research papers about it. So if you're interested in more of what I have to say, I have a pollinator website that is a result of an LCCMR from the state of Minnesota. We have a educational workshop for master gardeners and different groups to learn about pollinator conservation. We have a nice poster that talks about wasps and bees and how to tell the difference. And we have a couple of handouts on pesticides and uh, pollinators. And we also have many, I maintain the website myself. I'm kind of like the Wizard of Oz. I am behind the curtain doing everything. And I maintain the website with all update publications on pesticides and bees. So that's my specialty, pesticides and bees. And I leave all questions to habitat and species diversity to Marla and her team. So if you wanna learn more about um, bees and pesticides, please visit this website. So I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this slide, but the questions were asked here about what do these uh, native bees pollinate? So things like blueberries and zucchini and uh, different uh, apples, cherries, all of those in the state of Minnesota need pollinators. And it's come to be such a problem that I get calls from blueberry growers and they're putting out managed bumblebee colonies because they don't think they're gonna have enough pollinators when pollination season comes around. So why do we need pollinators? Well, we need them for seeds, 
and then the fruits that grow around seeds. And I am really concerned about native plants. Native plants are in decline because of habitat destruction. Um, but without a seed bank, you don't have native plants. And without native bees pollinating native plants, you don't get a seed bank. So this is not a little issue. Most of our management in agriculture or roadside has been to remove volunteer plants. And we've made it so that weedy invasive exotics from Europe do better because lots of times they're not pollinated by bees, they're pollinated by wind, they produce tiny little seeds, and they spread in disrupted habitat. So by and large, the habitat management that we have, we are performing right now in agricultural fields and roadsides is actually one that promotes non-pollinated plants. And so uh, this habitat issue really is a huge issue to maintain pollinators. But I want to talk to you about what's going to happen if we lose bees. And there's a picture there with a guy in a tree, and that's from China. And as we all read in the news, China is uh, very uh, much, uh, uses a lot of pesticides. And so they no longer have a lot of bees. And so this guy is hand pollinating apples. So they actually pollinate them by hand, which I think uh, is a very expensive resort to uh, uh, get stuck with if we can just conserve our pollinator abundance and diversity. So what is the history? What brings us here today to talk about this? And it started a long time ago. And so let's start at the bottom of the list, 1996. The French beekeepers know, noticed when a new class of insecticides was registered, it affected bees. And this is what the beekeepers said in the beginning. They said the foragers weren't coming back, but the colony had nectar and it had brood. So there was food in it. Oh, I see some people looking at me. I have two handouts. One is a copy of my slides, and one is another handout. I can, uh, has my name on them on the top, so there are two handouts. One goes with my slides, and the other one is a general handout. So what the French beekeepers in 1996, they um, petitioned the government. They had uh, uh, large-scale protests on the streets of Paris. <coughs> And they got the government to stop the use of this new systemic insecticide, imidacloprid, on the seeds of sunflowers, just sunflowers in the beginning. And they came back and said that had helped them because a lot of honeybees were using sunflowers to, for nectar. And sunflowers produce a lot of nectar. So again, getting back to what happened is they said the foragers didn't come back. I want you to keep that in mind because this has become the basis of whether you accept that neonicotino insecticides are a problem or you say they're not. It has to do with the effect of neonicotinols on foragers. So 2004 to 2009, as it is, the EPA allows states to be more restrictive in the registration of pesticides. And New York State, since it had had a very high frequency of breast cancer, which they associated with DDT and its metabolite DDE, that was an estrogen disruptor to increase the amount of estrogen, which is known to create breast cancer. They were very proactive environmental issues, and they banned the registration of most of the neonicotinols between 2004 and 2009. California was also proactive, and they, like the US EPA, are right now reviewing the registration of imidacloprid and the other neonicotinols. 2011 to 2008 to 2011, bee deaths are linked to the planted, planting of neonicotinol seed-treated crops, which means that the chemical companies and the um, companies that make seed, they would pack around the seed a neonicotinol that was put on with a wax, and like Marla was talking about, something called an adjuvant, and it would stick to the seed. And during planting with hydraulic planters, this pesticide would come off as a dust and it started to kill bees. And there were very good reports out of Purdue University, out of Italy, out of France, that documented these bee kills and the amount of residue in the environment. In March of 2012, the U.S. beekeepers petitioned for clothianidin to be withdrawn from sale. Uh, clothianidin is one of the neonicotinols. I have a list coming up next. And then we had a very proactive decision this past year by the European Union it's called EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, which is analogous to our USDA slash EPA. They decided that there was eminent risk from neonicotinols, that more research was needed, and that they banned in December now for two years all neonicotinol use on flowering plants, plants that bees would visit. 
And one of the things they said we need is information about residue. How much is actually accumulating in plants and is it at a level that's going to affect bees? So let's talk about what is the difference that makes these systemic insecticides much more of a threat to bees than traditional insecticides we've used in agriculture and landscapes. What we call most insecticides um, contact insecticides. That means you spray it, it lasts for two weeks and it's denatured by light, by water, and then you use it again when you need it again. So hopefully it worked, it killed your pest insects and you can go for a period of time, a month, four weeks, without having to apply it again. So that flowers that open after the initial spray no longer contain insecticide. Now that is the crux of the difference between the conventional insecticides that were used and the neonicotinols that were registered in 1990. Systemic insecticides are like a herbicide. So you apply a herbicide, there's a chart with 28 ways that that herbicide penetrates the plant, different mechanisms to kill that weed. We don't have a lot of systemic insecticides, but this class of insecticides called neonicotinols, they all do that. You put it in the soil and it gets picked up by the plant and it's distributed throughout the whole plant. So when it first happened, I as a scientist promoted it because you didn't spray and spraying causes drift, which has non-target effects. So this, everybody embraced the idea you could put something in the soil, get picked up by the plant and you wouldn't have to do a contact spray. Unfortunately, we didn't really think that through adequately. And we really didn't realize that that meant it was translocated from the soil to the pollen and nectar of that plant forever. So it, it stays in the plant after one application for a year. My research says three years easy. So every time a flower opens, it has this neonicotino insecticide in it. So this is the crucial part of the issue, the difference between a contact and a systemic insecticide. So here are some LD50. So we talk about classes of insecticides, organophosphates is an older class, pyrethroids is an older class, neonicotino is this new class. And this is the toxicity. We have soybean aphid, which is a big problem. We use contact insecticides for it. And as I said, they last about two weeks and then they disappear. As Marla said, bees aren't visiting soybeans a lot. But look at this toxicity. It's very low, 15 nanograms per bee. Um, chloropyrifos, 70 nanograms per bee. Methylparathion, 11. Kumafos is what they use in beehives and it just uh, happens that the chemistry is not that toxic to bees. But then when we list the pyrethros, they all have relatively similar toxicity to the organophosphates. 15 nanograms per bee, 37. So if you want to know how much that is, when I take a heart healthy bare aspirin, that's eight milligrams, okay? So you, by the time we get to nanograms, it's a million times less. And the data that Marla spoke about earlier is data saying that 0.2 nanograms affects a bee memory. 10 parts per billion um, affect a bee. 10 parts per billion would be one nanogram. Affects a bee's ability to come back to the hive. So these sublethal effects are where we're realizing is the issue, not the out, 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 out mortality, it's the sublethal effects. But my point being here that the contact insecticides are also toxic, but they dissipate in the environment and a flower that opens after they've been sprayed to, doesn't contain anything that's gonna hurt the bee. So here are our systemics. I don't wanna spend a lot of time here, but this idea of a systemic insecticide is very novel. And the class, it's called the neonicotinos. It's that third blue line. And the active ingredients, the different chemistries that are registered are imidacloprid, clothianidin, thymethoxin, and dinotefuran. And these are applied as seed treatments in most of the crops that we plant in Minnesota, corn, soybeans. They're applied in potatoes, they're on sunflowers, they're on sugar beets, they're on practically everything. And what they do is they are translocated from the soil into the plant, into the leaves, and kill the pest insect but this idea that they got into pollen and nectar is kind of after the fact, we didn't realize it. So this slide is just trying to show you that we know what systemic insecticides are, but the most commonly used ones are the neonicotinol, these others, Temic is no longer available, Vidate, Oxymil is no longer available, Dimethoate is hardly used. So the neonicotinols are the only systemics. So in this banner, I say neonicotino insecticide toxicity to bees, sublethal dose, more than 20 parts per building, two nanograms per bee, reduces foraging memory and navigation. 
The LD50 studies evaluate for mortality, not foraging. So this is what 20 years of research has taught us. Since 1996, when the French beekeepers ascended on Paris and said that um, these neonicotinoid seed treatments on sunflowers were killing bees, the government banned it. Um, what we have figured out, and again, the French government, very proactive, they gave a lot of money to INRA, the French research labs, and what they have figured out is that it's not overall death mortality, it's that they can't remember. So it ends up that there's a certain receptor in bees called the N-nicotinic, the nicotinic acetylcholinesterase re receptor. Bees have 40% more in, uh, than other insects. They're aggregated in the brain and they're called a mushroom body. And that's what has to do with higher bee function. That has to do with navigation, foraging, remember, how to do your dance to your buddy. Has to do with everything. Bees have more of these receptors. And so the sublethal dose is they can't figure out how to go home. So in a research paper I just um, got done getting, de getting the data done, it's been submitted, accepted. What we found was in bumblebees, 20 parts per billion, two nanograms per bee, once they drank this insecticide for a week, they couldn't figure out how to walk to a tube back to their nest. That's how the sublethal doses. So I've come to accept this is real from my own research reading 100 different papers. So it's not the lethal dose, it's not gonna kill them outright, is they can't remember who they are or where to go, that's the problem. But I have this table up here to show about four nanograms per B, uh, metoclopride, um, clothianidin, three nanograms, dinotopurin, 23, thymethoxan, five. <coughs> Again, thinking of our 80 milligram heart healthy aspirin, this is a minute <coughs> amount. And uh, that, in lab studies, kills bees. So what about these chemicals? What, you know, what, do they, what else do they do? that is contributing to their long-lasting issues. So this is a way a scientist would evaluate the persistence in the environment of a neonicotinol. And so what I have to tell KLC is how long they bind to something, solubility is how soluble they are in water, and then you have the OD50 for rats. And if you look at aminoclopurid, it binds to soil. If you look at the column over dino to furan, the trade name is Safari 23, it's KLC, it doesn't bind to soil very much. So I've had pesticide companies call me and say, Vera, would you promote the use of dinotefuran in citrus because we can apply it to the trunk, it will get in the tree, kill citrus psyllid, greening disease, which is a big issue for citrus production, and it will be gone in two months because the KOC, its binding capacity is very low. So what makes something, the mechanism that makes a pesticide responsible for this long duration in plants and in the soil has to do with their chemical formulation. So the neonicotinols bind very well to soil, organic matter, they're released slowly. So as Marla mentioned earlier, if you plant green, if you plant clover or a bee cover crop, you have to be very careful that you measure how much neonicotinol is in that soil. The first actual research paper that identified an uh, issue with neonicotinol use and cover crops was from, um, New, from Canada, New Brunswick, where they would take potatoes and then they would plant clover afterwards and they use imidacloprid on potatoes for Colorado potato beetle. And what they found is that they got very high levels of imidacloprid in the clover um, but it dissipated through time. But that was the first scientific paper that made uh, us aware of this KOC, this ability to bind and then get slowly released in water, which makes the neonicotinols persistent. So here is the bad news. This is a chart from the USGS from 1994 and 2009. If you want to go yourself, you just Google USGS pesticide charts. It shows you the distribution of maybe 100 pesticides around the United States. And so from 1994 to 2009, remember neonicotinol, the first one registered was metoclopid. It wasn't registered to the early 90s. Hardly any use. And in 2009, it's used everywhere. And so the darker the color, the higher the amount they're finding in the environment. So when I say this is a ubiquitously used insecticide, it has very low mammalian toxicity. If you remember the chart I just showed you and look down there at rats, 5,000 parts per milligrams per kilogram part per billion. Um, very low toxicity to mammals, but very high, very high sublethal effects on bees 
do their the N acetylcholinesterase phase receptors and their mushroom bodies in their brain. So look how widely this is used. This is mostly from seed treated crops because as I said, they put imidacloprid on the seed, they plant the seed. Um, but you could, do, any of those other three active ingredients, clothianin and thiamethoxan, dinotefuron, you can get the own chart and it will look the same. So why is there a difference, and I'm almost done, why is there a difference between the US and the European Union system? Where the European Union said in 2013, we're gonna ban these insecticides on flowering plants for two years because of eminent risk. Well, our system is based on a um, incident reporting. So the EPA has a website, and if you find a pesticide kills bees, you need to report it. Now, one of the issues, um, and I learned this from interacting with the EPA administrator, Jim Jones, came to talk to Marla and I this summer, uh, that beekeepers don't like to do incident reports because they're worried about having their bees able to forage in the crop. They're worried about the far denying it, far, farmer denying it. So one thing happened this summer, and it happened in Oregon, and the Xerces Society is there. And so in a target parking lot, they apply dinotefuran safari, which I just talked to you about, and it was applied as a foliar, and they put it as a drench on the bark where it gets absorbed by the xylem and moves around the plant. And within a week, 25,000 to 50,000 bumblebees were dead. And so you see them on the ground here. So this is great as an incident report. It's finally an incident that the state of Oregon, the state of Washington, and that the EPA got involved with. Um, and what it ended up was they went out and they bagged all these trees to prevent the bees from getting to them. So these are linden trees, and linden trees are a favorite resource for any bee, a honeybee, or a bumblebee. I do my research mostly on bumblebees, native bees, and uh, so they bag the trees. And um, one of these was not a misapplication. It's according to the label. Now, the state of Washington sent me a brochure, I helped them edit it, and on it, they had, you should not apply a neonicotinol at bloom. But the problem is, is what did we just talk about? The KOC, the binding in the soil to the organic material, it doesn't matter. It stays in the tree for a year. And this is the problem. We didn't realize these issues when we registered these neonicotinol insecticides. So this is a great incident report. So in the US, 143 of 442 million acres use these neonicotinols, so one third of all the acreage. There you see the statistics from the MDA website and California and the US, 52,000 pounds of active ingredient. Now remember, a formulation for landscape can be 0.1%. So this is actually active ingredient in pounds, which is a tremendous amount of uh, systemic insecticide that's being used, not only in our state, but in the whole US. So the technical information, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but 0.11 milligram is how much you apply of imidacloprid to a canola seed. Four milligrams per square foot is the agricultural rate. And the landscape rate is much higher, 300 milligrams, 630 milligrams. And trees, it's even higher. So Bear has visited me, David Fisher. We've gone over this data. And uh, you know, he agreed that landscape use was very high for these neonicotinols compared with the field rate or the seed treatment rate. So I have to say, there's just been a beautiful study published by the chemical industry. It's shown that these seed treatments um, don't have much of an effect on bee colonies. And uh, that's because the level in pollen and nectar is very low. It's below four or five. But when we start adding more to the environment, it stores itself in the environment and organic material gets re-released in the plant and the residue levels go much higher. So let's just look at these residue levels. <coughs> Sunflower, two parts per billion nectar, four in pollen, that's seed treated. Pumpkin from the four milligrams per square foot, you can get the high. There's always more in pollen than nectar, 87. My research from a landscape application, 6,000 parts per billion. I have to say, I have my, my research has all been verified by the USDA's only lab that does residue analysis. So this is now all verified numbers. Eucalyptus tree in Berkeley, California, 550 parts per million from a soil drench. And the last two are Bayer's own research papers, um, five to 283 parts per billion and 1,000 to 2,000 parts per billion. And I have to say, everyone agrees that 172 parts per billion kills a bee on contact. 
So even Bear agrees on that. So to sum this up, uh, you heard lovely testimony from my colleagues at the university about habitat influences on bee decline, about varroa, what's going on in the hive, both in terms of managing with insecticides and the problem since 1986 when varroa mites showed up. So it's a very complex issue, um, but I think now because of all the research, people are really beginning to understand this sublethal effect on bees in terms of foraging and the impacts that has on the colony. So my own research with bumblebees that was just accepted for publication says that in 11 weeks at 20 ppb, the more colonies are statistically dead than zero parts per billion. And that goes along with 15 to 20 published papers from Britain and France. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for being proactive and interested in protecting pollinators. That was very sobering testimony. Uh, and I know we're gonna have some questions, but let me start out with one. Uh, we've been talking about bees, and the, my question is, say uh, these neonics are put on a crop of potatoes. Has, have we looked at um, this, any effects about our eating those potatoes? Do the potatoes take those neonics up and uh, I, I, obviously, there's no lethal effects, but are, has anybody looked at the sublethal effects? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there is something called the Codex Alimentarius, and that's a book that all the countries write down the residue that a crop can have in it. And in the Federal Register, we publish, there is a small part of the FDA that looks at crops, looks at residue, and there is a tolerance. And if you have more than that, it can't be used. So, for instance, tomato. The uh, published threshold is six parts per million. That's 6,000 parts per billion. And it's because of this low toxicity to mammals. So yes, they do, uh, there is a regulatory branch of the government that keeps track of that. Yes, that is published in the Federal Register, but there's very uh, little of the crop is actually tested. But if it's out of tolerance, then that, that is an issue. So. Uh, is the science I, current on I mean, I know, we, okay, we have these standards, but some of the standards we have were developed years and years ago. Right. Are, have these standards been updated with the understanding that there are sublethal effects? No, no, Madam Chair, no. There's, as far as I read, and I do try to go over to that medical literature, um, I notice that uh, I don't see much going on. I notice that um, this flea and tick stuff that you use on a do your dog has systemic insecticides. It's either fipronil or imidacloprid, and you used to rub it in on the back of the neck with your finger, and now they have an applicator. And I have tracked that down on the web that there are a lot of people that got sick from using their finger because it's systemic, and they put a chemical on that DMSO that makes it absorb faster. So I have seen that, but I haven't seen much discussion on either more uh, um, regulatory action on looking at what's in crops or changing, lowering the tolerance. Thank you. Uh, Representative Purcell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just some clarification for me, if you would. Um, it, the KOC that you're using, it, is the OC organic carbon? An OP is an organic, uh, or, yeah, organophosphate. So uh, lindane, DDT, DDT were organochlorines, so OP is an organophosphate. So most insecticides have carbon, and so they used, all conventional insecticides used to be called organic carbons, because they contain carbon. We don't do that anymore, because people now get that confused with organic gardening. So now we just use the class. But yes, years ago they were called organic <coughs> carbons. <Yeah. But coughs> Madam Chair, that I'm, I'm looking at the slide that's got the water solubility. And the and the KOC and I just I, I'm familiar with the octanol water partition coefficients the KOW right. but I don't the K the KOC just, I just was looking for those yeah that's used in systemics because of this binding to soil and then getting released it, so, so it's like a partition coefficient yes exactly yeah, just a different measurement exactly. <clears throat> I was curious about the same question Representative Wiginius asked um, about sublethal effects, and and it sounded like the answer that you gave um, people were really looking at you know um, overt health effects. 
Um, I had the opportunity to look and see if there's any recent studies. And there's a study in February comparing the effects of nicotine and some of the neonicotinoids on um, neurological development of baby rats. So it looks like maybe someone's starting to pay attention to that. Have you seen any of that work? Or? Uh, Madam Chair and Committee, yeah, so there, uh, the old nicotine compounds were a little different in that they had a very low toxicity, which means they were very toxic to humans and caused sublethal effects. The neonicotinoids, the way they constructed them, they're called neonicotinol, the new nicotines, because they use a similar, they affect a similar pathway. They had low mammalian toxicity, but you're right, people in the beginning did not um, spend a lot of time sorting out the sublethal effects. So I think now that pretty much everyone has become aware of this N-nicotinic acetylcholinesterase the receptor, they're beginning to go back and evaluate other issues uh, with its sublethal dosages on mammals. So I know there were some papers published uh, uh, in Japan where uh, people who drank green tea, um, green tea isn't fermented like black tea, so the chemicals aren't decomposed. And if you drank 10 cups of green tea, you started to tremble, hallucinate, and couldn't remember. And that's what made the Japanese government realize that uh, there needed to be some more uh, scientific research on the neonicotinols, sublethal neonicotinols on humans. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Doctor, some of the earlier testimony, at least uh, what I took from it, said that uh, in terms of habitat, the bees didn't do a lot of activity in soybeans and or very little in soybeans and, and some in corn. And now one of your slides said that the bees did have activity in corn. So a seed treatment, for example, in soybeans uh, where bees are not very active, would that be worse than having a seed treatment in corn, for example? Uh, Madam Chair and Committee, yeah, I think that's exactly right. You have to ev evaluate it case by case. You know, the definition of integrated pest management is it's for every different crop and it's insect pests. It's a management system that you have to work on based on the life histories. So corn insects, ev evidently in Minnesota, they do use the pollen very actively. There's something called glutination, where when uh, the corn seedling is starting to grow and you have a very high level of the neonicotinols in the soil, it causes such osmotic pressure that they drip from the leaf tip and then bees that don't have a lot of water collect that and that's highly toxic to them. So there, that data has been verified by a couple of different research labs. So I think uh, corn, I think bees are utilizing the pollen. Marla made the uh, statement that in soybeans it's not as used as much. But again, in soybeans it's a foliar spray and so you can have drift. And so I included that data to show that all pesticides are toxic to bees but that the contact insecticides were different in that they're gone in two weeks. So I'm not trying to say soybeans are more of a threat to bees. I would agree with Marla and you that they're not as much a threat. Representative Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a kind of a side question. You know, the plant nicotiana, I was trying to look it up to see, uh, do they, are they harmful to our yeah, bees? Yeah, Madam Chair and Committee. So, Nicosia, I did research on nicotiana previously, and uh, it's a native plant. The Indians use it to hallucinate. It does have alkaloids in it that cause hallucination. Um, it has nicotine, which is one of these alkaloids. Theobromine in tea is another alkaloid. Caffeine, we all like caffeine, it's another alkaloid. And so, uh, these native plants do have secondary chemicals and they do affect insects, but, um, and they are secreted to a little bit. This is very shocking. They are secreted in flowers to a bit and insects do um, come in contact with them, but we're not talking about the high levels we're talking about when we're using insecticide. So, you know, what it ends up, what I teach my class is back when there are no flowering plants, there are only ferns, the insects crawled out of the water, they are originally flying, they are originally shrimp and their gills moved and became their wings. And so they directed the co-evolution of all the chemistries and flowers, all the different flower morphology, the nectar, the pollen. And it doesn't matter, this has nothing to do with God, it's just how God worked this evolution. And um, it ends up that all this diversity of chemical and leaves prevent insects from feeding on every plant. 
So yes, nicotine, the alkaloid nicotine is a toxin. Only a subset of, bee, of insects feed on those plants. Bees have a cytochrome P450 system that they use to detoxivate, They'll detoxify the little bit of nicotine that gets in the nectar. Good question. Mm. Um, just one other, thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm trying to remember back, I think earlier there was a discussion that California has a law that allows people to track pesticides at, 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 uh, use, I guess. Are there any states that have um, kind of a right to know when those pesticides have been used in, for example, we were talking earlier about people inadvertently buying a plant that they would sell, uh, that they would plant uh, thinking it would be a good pollinator plant, but it might actually be contaminated, or any of the other, you know, plants too, not just um, flowers or, or pollinator plants, but food. Is there any state that's looked at that or any scientists that have looked at that right to know what's in those plants or in our food? So, so Madam Chair uh, Committee, so what I can say is I think people have and so that's where the, you know, upsurge in buying organic products are. Uh, people, people are realizing it's an issue. Um, is the industry itself asking those questions about residue and plants and effect on people? Not that I, that not that I know of, but I think people themselves are coming to the conclusion that pesticide use may have impacts for their health, and that's the only reason I can support the increase in the organic market, the huge increase that nobody really thought would ever happen since they charge so much more for foods. I don't see the industry themselves regulating that. And I agree that it would be nice for beekeepers who are moving their bees or for anybody to be able to know in what area, what insecticides were, what pesticides were sprayed. I think that would be a good resource. Thank you. Super. Thank you for your testimony, sobering as it was. I think we need to understand. Our next test testifier was to be Dr. Karen Oberhauser from the University of Minnesota. She was not able to be with us today, uh, but Kelly Nail, uh, who is, works with her, is here uh, to do uh, a presentation on our monarch butterflies. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. First off, I'd like to thank you for having us come in today and discuss pollinators. Um, and as you said, I'll be presenting on behalf of both myself and Karen Oberhauser in the Monarch Lab at the University of Minnesota. We'll be talking about the dwindling numbers of a flagship species, which is monarchs. So to begin with, I want to discuss why should we care about monarchs? One reason we often care about a species is because they're a keystone species. That means that if they disappear, there's going to be big effects within an ecosystem. So for example, pollinators, many of the ones that were just discussed, would be considered a keystone species um, because once they're gone, there will be effects in that ecosystem. Same with insects in general. However, butterflies do pollinate. They're incidental pollinators, but they're not great pollinators. So they probably would not be considered a keystone species. Another reason we might care about an organism and want to conserve it is because they're indicator species. They indicate something about the ecosystem. This would be something like a canary in a coal mine, or for those of you who are fishers, stoneflies. These are organisms that live in areas with high concentration of oxygen in the water, so they indicate a healthy stream or river. However, as you can see in the second photo, uh, that's a picture of milkweed that was taken by one of our monarch volunteers. Milkweed can grow almost anywhere, therefore monarchs can live in very disturbed areas. So monarchs aren't great indicator species either. So the real reason um, that we should really care about monarchs is because they're a flagship species. What that means is they're a species that really uh, gets people involved in conservation and gets the community involved in conservation. And then when we manage for monarchs, we're also managing the same habitats for other pollinators as well. So I'm going to quick go through a brief history of monarchs, uh, why we should care about them a bit more in depth, and what's happening with their numbers currently. Monarchs have a complex life history, part of which is involved in Minnesota. 
as you can see in this map here, there's two main populations of monarchs. We have the eastern North American population, which is bounded by the Rockies all the way to the east coast, and that's the population that exists here in Minnesota. We also have the western population that's to the west of the Rockies. This population of monarchs every fall flies down from southern Canada, Minnesota, all the way over from Maine, down to a very specific forest in central Mexico. This is one generation of monarchs that makes it all the way down to Mexico. They stay in these forests for the entire winter, and then in the spring, those same monarchs that migrated all the way down begin the remigration back up into the U.S. They make it about halfway through the U.S. before they die, and their offspring are the ones that then come back up into Minnesota and the northern reaches of their range. There's about two to three generations then that occur with monarchs here in the summer, and those are the ones we see throughout the summer. And then this, this cycle happens again. To monitor monarch populations, we can record the size of their overwintering sites. So we look down in central Mexico to see how many monarchs are there by recording the size, and we can check again at the end of the wintering season to see how many monarchs made it through that wintering season. Monarchs require very specific habitat throughout these different stages. So when they're migrating south in the fall, they require trees <coughs> to roost on or form, form clumps, and they require flowers to get their nectar. When they're in Mexico, they require very specific trees. They use OML fir trees. And then throughout both the spring remigration and the summer up here in Minnesota, they require nectarine flowers for the adults. And what's very important is they require milkweed. This is the only plant that monarchs can grow on. So milkweed is very important. So this complex life history and the complex needs that monarchs have throughout their life cycle can make them more vulnerable to change because they need all of these specific requirements and losing any one of them can harm monarchs. Also, monarchs can be susceptible to anthropogenic change um, because the timing of their migration. One of the reasons that monarchs uh, decide to migrate south is based on the um, temperatures in the fall. So once the temperature gets cold enough, monarchs migrate south. If that changes, their migration may change as well. However, it should be noted that monarchs might also be less vulnerable to anthropogenic change because they can uh, travel such long distances. They can travel long distances to find the resources they need. The second point I wanted to make is that people are very interested in monarchs. So this is sort of expounding on monarchs as a flagship species. This is kind of violating the, the cardinal rule of PowerPoint slides and that there's a lot of words there, uh, but I don't want you to read through them all. The point of this is to show that there are many different organizations that use citizens um, to monitor monarchs. This is just a list, it's not even a comprehensive list of all the programs that are monarch specific that people are, are involved in to help monitor the health and population status of monarchs. Here's one example here, this is Journey North. This is a citizen science program, so it uses citizens throughout North America to monitor monarchs coming back in the spring. So each and every one of these points on the map is someone going out, looking for monarchs, and then reporting it to this site. Monarchs are also the state insect or butterfly of seven different states, including Minnesota. As you can see here in 1998, Minnesota made monarchs the state insect. And another way that people are interested in monarchs is by having their monarch breeding habitat. We have over 7,000 registered monarch way stations in the US. This is where people go out, they plant milkweed, they plant nectar sources for monarchs, and then they go online and they register these requirements and pay a fee to have this sign that notes them as a monarch way station. Monarchs are also very important for education. Monarchs are used throughout North America. These are pictures, the upper left-hand picture 
these monarchs being uh, taught at the overwintering sites in Mexico. These are educators down here. And as a former public high school biology teacher, I know the importance of butterflies being used to teach different units in uh, the classroom. Some recent news, as you might have seen, uh, came out of a study that was published by Karen Oberhauser and some of her colleagues. And this was based on a willingness to pay survey. Based on the results of this survey, uh, we see that people are willing to pay over $4 billion theoretically to save monarchs. This is equivalent to what people are willing to pay for whooping cranes or wolf conservation. And one thing that we want to note as well, this actually isn't in the study, it's unpublished, uh, but this comes from that same willingness to pay survey. The question, the exact question that was asked of people was how aware were you that monarch numbers were in decline before reading about it here? We don't have the key here, but the darker the color represents the more aware someone was of uh, the decline of monarch butterflies. And you can see that Minnesota is sort of a hotbed for awareness of monarch butterflies and the plight they currently face. We're often asked at the Monarch Lab, why? Why do people care about monarchs? And some of the reasons are because monarchs are beautiful, not just in the butterfly form, but also in their larval and pupal stages. Monarchs are very familiar. They're commonplace throughout the US and throughout North America. Monarchs are interesting. They provide us with lots of answers to different questions about ecological, uh, ecological questions we might have. Currently in our lab, we're studying monarch behavior, monarch parasitoids, the effect of climate change on mi monarch migration, as well as many other questions. And finally, monarchs are impressive. Monarchs are the weight of a paperclip and they can migrate all the way down from Canada to Mexico and then begin coming back. And that's impressive for any organism. However, the third point is that despite this interest in monarch butterflies, monarch numbers are declining. As I mentioned earlier, the way that we record monarchs uh, population size is by measuring the winter colony area. These are the numbers we have and you can see that there is a downward trend in the number of monarchs that are located in the Mexican overwintering colonies. We don't have the results yet for this year, but they have been unofficially <coughs> recording them and it looks like it is the worst year that has been ever recorded. Because of this, the monarch migration is at risk. It has been uh, put by the World Wildlife Fund as one of the top 10 species to watch. It's also been put on several other lists as an endangered biological phenomenon. There are many reasons for this decline. So it's a problem with many causes. One of the big ones is loss of breeding and migratory habitat. The US is currently losing over 5,000 acres per day of habitat to real estate and energy development. So a lot of this land before had nectar sources and milkweed and no longer does. Another big reason and cause of habitat loss is herbicide tolerant crops. So in another study that was done by Karen and other colleagues showed that many monarchs, actually almost 50 times more monarchs were coming from agricultural areas than non-agricultural areas. And that's because there's a lot of milkweed habitat that was present <coughs> both in between the rows of crops and along the edges of crop fields. However, we've lost most of that milkweed habitat due to the um, herbicide use on Roundup Ready crops, both corn and soybean plants. And you can see here that as we've had an increase in both soybean and corn Roundup Ready crops, that coincides with the decline of monarchs in the Mexican overwintering sites. Another cause for the decrease in monarch population numbers is overwintering habitat loss. I mentioned earlier that monarchs in Mexico use a very specific tree down in Mexico, the OML fir tree. And there's been lots of illegal and some legal logging that has been done in the monarch Mexican overwintering colonies. The upper right hand corner is Cerro Pelon, which is one of the larger overwintering colonies. And you can see that areas of, it, of that colony have been clear cut. 
in the bottom right hand corner shows an example of subsistence logging or smaller scale logging, uh, where it's just one or two people who are going in and cutting small amounts of trees. There's other factors of, as well that could be affecting monarch population size, uh, population size, including insecticides. This is from a study that was done with permethrin uh, that killed the monarch larvae. We know that climate change can affect monarchs. This is a picture from the overwintering colony and all of these monarchs are dead on the ground after a severe storm that happened in the colonies. Millions of monarchs died in this one storm event. Another reason is invasive species. This particular species is a swallowwort, which can serve as a monarch sink. What that means is it's a very similar species to milkweed, and monarchs will sometimes be fooled and lay their eggs on it, but remember that only milkweed can serve as a food source for monarchs, so that once those eggs hatch, they will not live. Another reason might be collisions with vehicles, but we don't yet have accurate data on that. So the final point I'd like to make is one on how we should respond to this problem. It has many causes, how we should not respond. Don't wanna just hang our heads and assume there's nothing we can do since there's so many problems or since there's so many causes to this problem. We also don't wanna argue about whose fault the problem is, even though there's many different causes in different areas throughout the monarch's population range. We're working right now with the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a collaboration between many different organizations, including state agencies, NGOs, and other groups. And one of the main things that we're working on is monarch habitat conservation. We're working to restore areas with nectar and milkweed sources. These are all pictures within Minnesota. This is a middle school in Rochester where they're planting a butterfly garden. And like I said, the main purpose of these is to provide milkweed and nectar sources. We have priority milkweeds for each region, so that we have native milkweeds. And this is in the handout uh, that was provided. Uh, I believe Karen provided it. If not, I have extra copies. And we also want to increase milkweed seed production and availability. There's 73 native milkweeds in North America of which about 30 are known to be used by monarchs, but only three are available commercially as seeds. So we're trying to increase this. This is a picture in California uh, where they're producing native seeds for that Western population that you saw earlier in the talk. Finally, we're working to increase research and monitoring, both at the university levels and with citizen science groups. As you saw earlier, that long list involves many different projects. This one on the lower uh, left-hand corner is a monarch tagging program where we can see if the monarchs that are tagged up here in Minnesota in their northern ranges make it all the way down to Mexico. Finally, I'd like to end with talking about how our efforts will be worthwhile. Monarchs exist in many different habitats, both pristine habitats and disturbed habitats. And by preserving these habitats for monarchs, we're also preserving them for many other species and pollinators as well. Monarchs are an incredibly interesting organism used for many different purposes, including education, and we still have a lot to learn from them. And finally, the monarch migration is truly an unmatched biological phenomenon, and it would be a shame to lose it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that testimony. Members, are there questions here? Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, milkweed and prairie? Madam Chair, could I get further clarification? <laughs> well, I, I'm just, I'm not, I don't see a lot of milkweeds when I've been on prairie excursions. Are they native to our Minnesota prairie? And uh, do we plant them when we try to restore a prairie? I can't speak to that exactly, Madam Chair, uh, but I can speak to milkweed is native to this area and it, it does prefer disturbed habitats. We tend to find it along roadsides um, and uh, in other disturbed areas like along pathways. We will. 
We will find some more information on that. Yes. We will find out some more information on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any other questions? I don't see any. Oh, wait a minute. Representative Clark? Well, this is just kind of a fun one. If I wanted to get some milkweed seed to give to. Uh, I'll give you some. I'll give you some. What a nice um, you know, holiday present that might be for some of the children who are so interested. <laughs> there is a monarch festival in my district yes. uh, every fall, and so I'll, next year I will make sure everybody gets invited. So that would be that's great, by Madam Chair. Lake <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Eric Runquist from the Minnesota Zoo. We're moving along members uh, to hear from the zoo because they are doing some preservation of species and uh, something quite unusual and I wanted you to hear about it. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I am Eric Runquist. I am the butterfly conservation biologist at the Minnesota Zoo. There we go. Thank you. So, yeah, I've been interested in butterflies really since I was a little kid, and it's a really uh, kind of a dream job for me to be chasing butterflies professionally. Um, and but I've always been really fascinated by their diversity, the hundreds of thousands of species of butterflies and moths that exist. And not only their, just their diversity, but also the, the really bright color patterns and complex life histories that make them really fascinating and charismatic insects that so many people care about. And I thank you for your interest in, in uh, the discussion on pollinators today. There are about 146 butterflies that are known from the state of Minnesota to basically live all or part of their life here about 10 times or 20 times as many species of moths though. And in the, for many species, we just don't know much about the moths in general. Um, like I said, there's quite a diversity of, of patterns out there and butterflies can be one of the most um, obvious insects on the landscape and they can be quite abundant. But as Kelly mentioned and others have, have discussed, uh, they, they are often sort of accidental pollinators. Um, the majority of their activities as adults are actually going for the nectar sources and not really going for the pollen. They don't really feed on pollen. So what they're trying to do is exploit the resources the flowers are providing, but um, they can transmit pollen. So for example, these two small butterflies inside this wood lily may not actually intercept much in the way of pollen um, when they're accessing the nectar resources, but a larger butterfly would bump into those uh, pollen resources and be able to transmit them between flowers. Other flowers have, or like milkweeds, have more complex means of transmitting pollen between plants. So for example, milkweeds have packets of pollen that have to be actually attached to a leg of an insect and it takes a large insect to be able to pull that out and transmit it to the next one. So a bumblebee would do that or a large butterfly could do that. Um, that's not to say though the butterflies are not really quite important. But like I said, they can be one of the most abundant insects on the landscape and so they can serve as, as a, the, even if it's an accidental pollination transfer, uh, the number of butterflies moving around between plants can do a lot. For other species of, of plants like this prairie phlox, they have a very long tube at, and it's only at the very bottom of that at, at which nectar is provided. So it takes a, a specialized insect like a butterfly with a very long proboscis to reach down into there to access it. And in the process of doing that, it actually uh, transfers pollen. In fact, one of the most endangered plants in Minnesota, the Western Prairie Finched Orchid, is exclusively pollinated by sphinx moths and only a couple species of sphinx moths are known to do this. Uh, I've highlighted here a on with a black line the nectar spur. At the very bottom of that is where the nectar is provided and in order to access that nectar the, the sphinx moths must interact with the floral structures in just the right way to be able to transmit pollen between plants. So without these hawk moths we would not have the western prairie fringed orchid and it is a 
listed species. Now, much of what we know about the state of butterflies and moths in the state of Minnesota is due to the great work that Minnesota DNR has been doing for decades. Um, and I really have to acknowledge their work in this. Um, the, the state of Minnesota is currently going through a process of updating this, the state wildlife action plans and form the formation of numerous species technical advisory groups um, that are focusing on updating the species of greatest conservation need. And there's one that's focusing on the butterflies and moths. There's another one that's focusing on bees. And at, at current, we've got about 31 species of moths and butterflies. But again, the majority of those are, are butterflies. We know little about the status of moths. And that's a general problem when we're trying to assess conservation status of many of these species. We just lack data from many, many species. The majority of them are butterflies to date because they are well known. Uh, but the other question to wrestle with then is, at what point is it a real conservation need due to habitat loss, for example, versus just a lack of data? So we're trying to evaluate this thing right now. There, are, there is currently only one butterfly listed in the state of Minnesota as a, as a federal, federally listed species. The Carner Blue is listed as endangered. It has been teetering on the edge of extinction in the state of Minnesota for, for many years and may now actually be extinct depending on some recent survey data. Um, but two species were, were just proposed this last October for, for addition to the federal species list. Uh, the Powasheek Skipperling, which I'll talk to more about in a second, as endangered, was, uh, was proposed to be listed as endangered, and the Dakota skipper was proposed to be listed as threatened. And both of these had the majority of the range in Minnesota and were one of the most common species. Both of these species are prairie endemics. So prairie is one of the most important biologically and culturally um, important components of the, uh, in, in the state of Minnesota. Um, and instead of vast oceans of, of prairie that stretched on for hundreds or thousands of miles here depicted in yellow, um, really we've lost almost all of that and we're down to less than or about 1% of that historic 18 million acres in the state of Minnesota. And so really all of the little remaining pieces here in red are just really small islands with their own problems now. And that's a real problem for small butterflies and moths that have a poor dispersal abilities and just can't be moved between patches. They might spend their entire lives in an area smaller than this building. So because of that endangeredness in the prairie, the majority of the species of butterflies and moths, the Lepidoptera, that are on the state's endangered, uh, threatened, or special concern list are prairie species. Um, in fact, th these, uh, the butterflies and moths are the only species currently on the state endangered uh, threatened or in special concern list. They're non evaluated for bees, for example. Um, so, two of these, like I talked about, are the Pauchy Skipperling and the Dakota Skipper. And, and this is what the zoo is really focusing on. But we're really broadly interested in all of these species because they are, they're symptoms of a larger problems on the prairie. One of these species is the gorgeous phlox moth, prairie phlox moth, um, which is another obligate pollinator of its own larval host plant. The regal fritillary stretched formally from Nova Scotia to Colorado and has to be probably the most beautiful butterfly in the upper Midwest. Monarchs are great too, but I think these, these might just overpass them. Uh, but they are essentially extinct east of the Mississippi River and within the remaining core of the range in green, it's, that green is a dramatic overestimation and we really are only talking about tiny fragments. Minnesota has good populations, not the best, not the worst. The Dakota skipper was probably most common in Minnesota historically, um, at least some of the locations, but has had a, exper experienced a dramatic decline recently. Um, it's extinct in Iowa and Illinois as far as we can tell and it's disappeared from about half of the rest of those triangles just in the last few decades. And in Minnesota, recent work has only found probably one population in the state of Minnesota remaining near Moorhead. And there was potentially one seen in far northwestern Minnesota this year, but we can't confirm it. So the largest remaining populations of this really Minnesota native butterfly are now outside of the state. The Powasheek Skipperling, I think, is the most Minnesotan of all butterflies. The monarch is the state butterfly. The Powasheek Skipperling is the most Minnesotan. 
It had half of its historic range in the state, a greater concentration in Minnesota than any other butterfly in the world. Um, so the brighter the red, the more locality records we have here. But it hasn't been seen in Minnesota now in six years. It's also disappeared from North and South Dakota, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana. So 95 or more percent of the range that we think it's disappeared from. And all we're left with are these tiny populations on the periphery of the range in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Manitoba. And recent really intense survey data over the last year found only a few hundred individuals, and we're probably talking well under 500 individuals of this butterfly left in the world scattered across these three little spots that are never going to have any contact with each other. So the power chic skipperling is way more endangered than the panda. Three to four times as many wild pandas as Powashik skipperlings. So this is the most Minnesotan butterfly, but it's also one of the most critically endangered animals on Earth. So in recognition of that troubled state, not only of the Powashik skipperling and the Dakota skipper and all the other prairie butterflies, we, the Minnesota Zoo launched the butterfly uh, conservation program, the Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program in 2012. And we seek to use the, the, the resources and experience of the Minnesota Zoo as a conservation organization specializing in the breeding of endangered species to create insurance populations at the zoo to preserve the genetic integrity and whatever we have left of this butterfly in the zoo environment. Um, these are not on exhibit. They're, they are there simply as a conservation resource. We are also using our role as Minnesota's largest educator, environmental educator center, um, to, to talk about the role of butterflies and these butterflies and the role of the prairies. And we've been partnering with a huge number of people, DNR has been huge, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and a lot of other organizations that have been really critical. It's really an international effort. Um, and until a recent recommendation for funding under LCCMR, um, we have entirely been funded by the Legacy Amendment to date. But I really want to make this not a story about this endangered little butterfly. Um, I really want to talk about them as a tool to think about what's happening in the landscape on the prairies. Um, like, I, like I said, and, and Kelly has, has been nailed on, um, we, we need to think about butterflies not as um, just by themselves, we need to think of them as part of the larger landscape. And so the, you know, the majority of the life of a butterfly in a moth is going to be actually in the immature stages. The monarch is actually kind of an exception that way that spends the majority of its life as, a, as an adult. Um, the majority of most species, especially those that don't migrate, are, are caterpillars. And so they're, they're out there in the environment and feeding on, on native plants that are frequently not the nectar sources that they're using. So to advance some of that work, the Minnesota DNR has also been uh, doing a tremendous amount of work on, on creating vascular database or databases of, of plants um, and classifying Minnesota's communities um, and doing some, uh, some really good sampling out there. So we can talk about butterflies and moths as pollinators. Um, but I think the bigger thing we need to think about, like I said, is, is that they, they really are converting energy. They are feeding on plants and then they grow tremendously in the amount of size. This is a very young and now very fat monarch caterpillar. Um, tr they consume a tremendous amount of biomass in the plant world that, that then becomes available for other insects and other species um, and other vertebrates. So, there, so butterflies are actually a great food source for many animals. But I think the biggest thing we need to think about of them is as indicators. Um, butterflies have very complex life cycles, as do moths, they, with, the, with the adult, which lays an egg, and the caterpillar feeds on, on a specific or uh, usually, yeah, usually one plant, and it's a whole life, it grows multiple times, forms a pupa, and then an adult. And each of these arrows transitioning from one layer to the next is hormonally and environmentally controlled, and subtle and subtle variations can have a dramatic effect on their survivorship. So they can tell us a lot. So, for example, butterflies are one of the most heavily utilized organisms in climate change studies. We know that butterflies are shifting their ranges; they're moving north, and in fact, the rest of the the species that are on the state's endangered, threatened, or special concern list are actually 
butterfly is endemic to the north woods, and so they're losing their cold pockets. They're facing much of the same problems that moose are, for example. Um, so the butterflies are having to shift their ranges north, or at least attempt to, even if they don't have a good dispersal ability. Um, they're also coming out earlier in the year or lingering later into the fall, which can have a pretty detrimental effect if you try to pull off a second or third generation when normally you would only do two and you get smacked by a freeze. They have non-overlapping generations. Or they're also moving uphill and for some species adapted to cold climates in the top of the mountains, they've got nowhere else to go. So we can, we can think about butterflies and moths as indicators of, of greater changes. But I think the biggest and maybe, maybe the most interesting study that's come out recently about the role of butterflies are, as indicators was actually a consequence of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Just one year later, after the disaster, at levels of radiation that were deemed to be low, low enough to be safe for humans, a, a butterfly which has two generations a year, so this is two generations after the disaster, um, they, they had all these crazy mutations that were starting to show up with deformed eyes and extra limbs and new spotting patterns, things that had never been seen before, rather reminiscent of the, the problems with abnormalities in frogs in Minnesota lakes years ago. So clearly things were happening in the environment that we were not necessarily attuned to. And I think that's what the butterflies can really be telling us, like the Pawashik skippling, that they're, they're serving as these canaries on the prairie. They can tell us a lot about what's going on. So. Thank you, I'm happy to take questions. Questions for members? Thank you. Well, this is obviously a program funded at the zoo. Are we looking at any funding programs for butterfly preservation in the state? We, I mean. we will have a presentation from Susan Thornton about some recommendations from the LCCMR. Uh, and that would be about the first, and we'll we'll hear from that in about a few minutes. Actually. Oh, okay. I don't see any questions. Great. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it, and I think it's a, a uh, great testament to the Minnesota Zoo. Thank you, madam. Uh, the the next uh, will be uh, Steve Ellis. From Barrett, Minnesota, uh, a honey producer who also goes to uh, the almond orchards. Uh, I have to let you guys know that uh, he does keep bees on our farm. You all know we have a farm, and uh, we've had bees since before uh, we um, bought the farm in the 70s. Uh, but Steve also has a national reputation, uh, and that, of course, is why he's here. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you're just getting this thing, helping me, helping me through this stuff. I want to show it later as it's going along. Um, yeah, there's a number of things that were brought up that were really excellent by the by these presenters. I, I'd like to thank the, the committee for taking all this time and, and also for putting a, the thought and energy into trying to help with our pollinator crisis, which was so clearly delineated by the speaker. I'd like to thank this committee for inviting me to come to speak to you today. I'm honored to share the agenda with these researchers and, and to see their exciting grant proposals. They contribute to the big picture of our current pollinator crisis, and I'm delighted to see the LC LCCMR recommending the funding of such important research that will contribute immensely to our understanding of this vital segment of the environment we refer to as our pollinators. As you can see, I am a commercial beekeeper. I am not a public speaker, so you'll have to bear with me here, but I appreciate your doing that. Pollination is a subject near and dear to my heart. My fascination with honeybees goes back 38 years, when in 1975, as a college sophomore, I shook my first package of bees into an empty hive box on the top flat roof of the biology building on the campus of Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. From that day on, I've been hooked by this fascinating insect. My name is Steve Ellis. I've been a commercial beekeeper in West Central Minnesota for over 35 years now. 
My company, Old Mill Honey, typically operates 2,300 hives of bees. We produce honey in Minnesota in the summer and pollinate nuts and fruits in California in the spring. Uh, some of the speakers have used terms like um, flagship species, indicator species, but I would also mention that with the honeybee, we are all of the above. We are a flagship species, we are an indicator species, and we are also a workhorse species. And we have a crossover effect here that, that others don't, in that we are absolutely essential to agricultural production, as well as native wildlife systems benefiting from us. Uh, we work together with farmers hand in hand. Um, farmers use chemicals to, pr to protect their crops. We use chemicals to protect our bees. We understand the problems farmers face. They understand the problems that we face. But we both need each other. And one without the other would not work. So that's an important distinction I'd just like to make from some of the things that were brought up. In the first half of my beekeeping career, pesticide injury to my bees was extremely rare. That changed in 1998 when the Minnesota State DNR initiated a national pilot program in my area to grow hybrid poplar trees known as the Wood Energy Scale-Up Project. Massive bee kills resulted from their insecticide spray program. Two other beekeepers and myself were forced to defend our livelihood with legal actions. This five-year legal wrangling finally concluded when the Minnesota Supreme Court ruled in our favor and the DNR agreed to modify their management practices and to remunerate the beekeepers for our injuries. This difficult experience taught me just how damaging insecticides can be to commercially raised honeybees and I've act actively advocated for protecting pollinators from pesticides ever since. For the past five years, I have served as the secretary of the National Honeybee Advisory Board. This board is comprised of equal numbers of representatives from each of the two major national beekeeping organizations, the American Beekeeping Federation and the American Honey Producers Association. We seek to educate and lobby for pesticide policy reform. I have participated and spoken at national and international conferences and I have attended extensive meetings with the chemical registration industry, the US EPA, and their state lead partners here in Minnesota, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture Pesticide Division. I know most of the key players on a first name basis. I've given interviews which have aired on Dan Rather Reports, NBC Nightly News, Al Jazeera News, NPR, and Minnesota Star and Tribune, and others. I've been actively involved in this pesticide pollinator thing for a very long time. Strangers who meet me on the street when they learn I'm a beekeeper invariably ask me what is killing off all of the bees. At this point, I would like to just share with the committee a short video clip that I prepared for the YouTube. And it'll be on your screens here. I'll, I'll try to hit the play button and make it work here. What am I doing wrong? Enter? Hit enter on it. Yeah, something to do with it. There, it's kind of windy. Spring is just coming to the state of The date is Tuesday, May 7th, 2013. Bees have been moved back to Minnesota from, from California with Old Mill Honey Company in Barrett, Minnesota. Spring is just coming to the state of Minnesota and bees are starting to stir, flowers are starting to open, and farmers are starting to go out in the fields. Neonicotinoid corn was planted in this field May 7th in the morning, and we started noticing effects almost immediately after that.
most of the bees died outside the hives, but we opened one up and looked on the bottom and found at one particular time 100 dead bees on the pallet of this one hive. Uh, 30 or 40 were still laying, twitching in severe neurological spasms. The others had, had succumbed already. source that was available for bees to work at this time is the willows. We took a close look to see how the bees were behaving when they were trying to forage them. It was shocking what we found. Bees literally incapacitated when they come in contact with the flowers. As, as Vera pointed out to you, this is an acute poisoning incident. You could see the bees twitching and, and uh, dying on the, in the yard in the location at the bottom of the hives. But the uh, sublethal effect also caused innumerable bees to just fly off and not be able to return. I estimate that these bees lost half their population due to this exposure event. I showed this same video clip to David Fisher of Bear Crop Life Science, LP. Bear and Syngenta are the two principal manufacturers of neonicotinoid seed dressing. As I said, I'm on a first name basis with these people. I know David personally. When he came out to investigate the incident, his 16 page final report dated July 8th, 2013 concluded, and I'll read from the report. Since most samples of dead or dying bees contain residues greater than five parts per billion, of clothianidin or thiamethoxin, it can be concluded that neonicotinoid exposure likely contributed to the observed, observed mortality. This video shows graphically why beekeepers are so concerned with neonicotinoids. First, they are systemic to all parts of the plant, including nectar and pollen. Second, they are highly persistent in the soil with the availability to accumulate year after year and to be taken up by successive plantings or the plant tissue in woody plants and trees. Third, they're advertised as using lower pounds per acre. Due to their extreme toxicity, however, they can use less, but one, they are 7,000 times more toxic to honeybees than is DDT. One treated seed kernel of corn has enough clothianidin at, at the maximum treatment rate, if you equally dispersed it, would be able to kill 40,000 honeybees. I'll say that again because that's a staggering figure. One treated kernel of corn, typical of what is planted in the fields in Minnesota today, and it's on all field corn, one kernel contains enough chemical ingredient clothianidin or thiamethoxin or both to kill if equally dosed 40,000 honeybees. Uh, it's not only capable of killing through neurotoxic effects but it has now been demonstrated to also compromise the honeybees immune system making them more susceptible to parasites, pathogens and viruses which some improperly have referred to as the causes of our bee declines. One of the handouts that was available here was a study from, from Italy, which Marla also referred to, uh, which delineates the connection between uh, neonicotinoid exposure and compromising of honeybees immune system. They cross-tested it on other chemical uh, agents, on, on organophosphates and carbamates, and no correlation existed. Only the neonicotinoid class compromises the immune system. The other insecticide classes did not. Very important distinction. 
My time to present is limited, so I've provided you with additional handouts on a lot of material. I hope you will take all of these handouts, take some time, and read them further to try and educate yourselves on this developing environmental crisis. The handouts that I have in order, I'll just go over very briefly because I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, but one of them is, a, is uh, the first line is called Olcom's Razor. Uh, it describes uh, the, a connection of, of, of logical thought of why global bee deaths would be linked with neonicotinoids. Um, uh, another one that I handed out um, was on, it, it was uh, entitled Regulatory Agency Responses to Neonicotinoid Coated Seeds. It says the EU is banning them for two years, effective this December. Canada has recognized the problems that they can cause and is trying to work with the beekeepers to, to uh, make them less. US EPA, unfortunately, says neonicotinoid seeds are not even a pesticide application. They're a seed dressing. Minnesota Department of Agriculture came and investigated the same incident that you saw today and concluded that the observed bee mortalities may fall within EPA's acceptable boundaries of impact. Uh, the U.S. regulatory response and the response that has been received to date from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, who is the sole authority for pesticides in the state of Minnesota, has been grossly insufficient. Um, one of these, okay, one, both the, okay. Uh, this coming January 26th, I will be seated in a judge's chambers again. This time I'll be in San Francisco in U.S. District Court, the named plaintiff suing U.S. EPA for improperly allowing neonicotinoids out onto the market. I would be very helpful if some of you in this room today would put some fire under the feet of those in high positions in the MDA pesticide division. I would be glad to offer some concrete suggestions. If you're interested, talk to me later. Again, please take the time to reflect and read these materials I've supplied you with. The huge environmental hazard posed by neonicotinoid insecticides cannot be denied. If we are to preserve our insect pollinator base, honeybees are very sick. We need to be, we need to be concerned they are only the canary in the coal mine on this planet Earth. Aquatic systems, and there's a handout on a Canadian study of, of levels of these in aquatic systems in prairie potholes in Manitoba, which is sobering. 200 parts per billion have been, have been recorded in the prairie pothole water in Manitoba lakes uh, I, immediately after seeding of neonicotinoid treated canola seed in Manitoba. These prairie lakes is where I live, so this is a very near and dear subject to me, what can happen to the, to the water levels with these things. Aquatic systems are at great risk due to their, these compounds' extreme toxicity to aquatic invertebrates. And uh, um, I, I urge the committee to look further into that. Thank you for your interest on this subject today and your attention. I know that I'm the last presenter. It's been a lot of information to try to absorb. If there are any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Members, all of the slides that you've seen today and all of the handouts uh, with the names of people who gave them to this will be on uh, our website uh, this afternoon. I can say that with great confidence because I, Mr. Molesan is really good at this. So uh, everything will be on our website. So uh, if anybody wants to uh, access that way. Uh, Representative Erickson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what happened in this incident? You said it killed like half of the bees. Why didn't kill them all? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the the uh, exposure you have to have exposure to the chemical at a certain level to cause uh, both either death or or impairment enough to fly off and die, and um, some of the bees that were um, in, newly hatched out, for instance, were just inside the hive and were not outside the hive. They're called nurse bees for a period after they hatch out. The queen never leaves the hive. The nurse bees never leave the hive. There are bees that never leave the hive. So there are bees in the hive 
that are not exposed. And the larvae that are under cap seal are not exposed either. And they hatch out right afterwards and, and come up to try and replace. So the entire colony is not killed off, if, if you would. But the, uh, the honeybee colony is a super organism. It's 40, 50,000 individuals. And if you uh, knock out half of it, it's, uh, it's just not gonna properly recover for a very, very long time. Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. Mr. Ellis, yeah, I'm sure that was a very trying uh, event, but just trying to understand, I think you mentioned that cornfield next to your hives had been planted that, that same morning. Mm -hmm. Now that seed is a couple of inches under the ground. How could that seed treatment have affected the bees that same day? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, and the, I, I, this is a great question. This is one that, that a lot of people struggle with trying to understand. Um, corn, when it is planted, for instance, is put into um, hoppers and, and is put in with a, a lubricant, which is called you, you, typically either talc or graphite, and is put into a pneumatic drill. Uh, pneumatic, what is that what I say? Yeah, it's yeah. air pressure, air drilled, and, and it's driven through air and forces the seed down into the ground, okay? And, and the, the coating and the movement of the seed through the, the drill uh, mechanism that moves the seed from the hopper mechanically through and then down and forces it into the ground um, actually takes a lot of air pressure and, and and as the seeds are being agitated and moved, the, the coating, coating on the seed that has been applied becomes agitated with the talc and, or the graphite and comes off in, in a cloud of dust. And this dust cloud is, uh, is not unsubstantial. It's a, when you have a compound that is as toxic as I described it, the, the, the coating on one kernel of seed is enough to kill 40,000 bees. It doesn't take a lot of dust to be extremely toxic. And this is an just as in Bhopal, the people didn't die, you know, that, that uh, it, they just breathed the gas cloud that came across them and that was all it took. Um, there, uh, it, it's a similar thing with, you're saying the seed goes underground, but during the planting process, the dust is given off. There's, uh, when we were first uh, informed of this, uh, there was a big incident in Germany with a lot of bees killed. And the chemical registrants all assured us that they had really good stickers, that all of this chemical was gonna stay on the seed, none of it was gonna come off. And that we wouldn't have those kind of problems like they had in Germany, where, who banned it as a result. They assured us we wouldn't have these problems here. But I think you can see from the video that we do indeed this year have these problems here that they assured us we wouldn't. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I, I, I have to ask if there were another method of getting that seed treatment in the ground, for example, a liquid that would dribble the seed or the treatment alongside the seed and not produce dust, would that be more advantageous to keeping the bees alive? Well, neonicotinoids are relatively new compounds that, are, that we're learning as we go, yes. And hopefully we will learn about this dust issue and, and how to deal with it. Uh, I, it's a person stepped forward that's a farmer friend of mine and said, you know, I'm a, I'm a tinker, I've got six US patents already, I'll design a, a, a filter system for these air drills and we'll filter this stuff out, we'll keep the clouds from coming at you and he called it the bee saver and, and he, he has, uh, he has a lot of interest right now in getting, uh, purchasing this from him. Uh, that might be cured, but even if it was, Dr. Jeff Pettis, lead USDA bee researcher, has stated publicly that even if we cure this dust problem, which is a major problem, everybody agrees it's a problem with these neonicotinoids, even if we cure that with corn, for instance, he believes that the contamination of the corn pollen with the systemic expression of this compound and the, and the exposure of the bees and the brood to the pollen that is laced <laughs> with this stuff is a bigger problem, Dr. Jeff Pettis concludes, than is just this dust. So 
there's a lot of problems with these neonicotinoids. I've shown you one incident and one instance, but the systemic nature of them is, I, I would agree with Jeff, the principal problem with this compound, that it can be systemic and long-lived and water-soluble. We need to take a really long, hard look at it. And, and uh, bees are in big trouble, and we've got to do something pretty quick. We can't wait around. Representative Mac McNamer, did you have a question? Madam Chair, Mr. Ellis, uh, do these chemicals have an adverse effect on humans? Um, Madam Chair, um, and Jay McNamer, Representative, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, the reason that these were fast tracked by EPA and, and by, and, and, and was, was to be a, a, a alternative to chemicals that had known problems with human health issues. Um, and on an acute basis, they have a low uh, uh, um, lethal effect on, on uh, mammals and vertebrates. Um, there, as, as, since they are so new and the studies are just coming in, uh, I, I, have to, I have to say that the, the verdict is not totally out, but there are some extremely troubling signs with regard to potential for human health issues and these compounds. And briefly, they are, they've been looked at in other countries for the most part. Japan has done quite a bit of studies with mice and rats that indicate that they, they can cause health concerns, including tumors and, 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 uh, and organ failures. Um, the Dutch, uh, Tenekes, has, has, has put forth that, um, that when these bind with the receptors, the, the, the real problem with these, um, the, the, the neonicotinoid binding with the, with the receptor is that it's cumulative and irreversible the damage that is done to the, to the receptors. So even if you have a, a minor impact with your first exposure, if you have a continued exposure up over a long period of time, it can build up. And that uh, is coming to be understood to be uh, very significant and of concern in, in human, um, with regard to human health, because these are so widely used that low level exposure <coughs> occurs at a very, it's a lot. And so um, what are all these low level exposures gonna add up to is really a question that needs to be very, very closely looked at. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here, Mr. Ellis. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of time visiting the uh, Wilmer Honey Farm in the Warroad area. You probably know of them. I'm curious to know, in, in your hives, uh, you said you've got about 40 to 50,000 uh, bees per hive. I'm wondering what your production has been like, uh, number of pounds of honey per hive. Um, well, thank you, and, and thank you for, for talking to your local beekeeper. That's, that's, uh, uh, I, I encourage everyone to do that. It's a great resource, and um, uh, it's a small community. Who is it in Wilmer? What's the fellow's name? Bruce Wilmer in War Road. Oh, in War Road, okay, yeah. Uh, there's really only about 1,000 or less of us commercial beekeepers in the United States. So we're kind of a small community. <laughs> we know each other, you know, a, a lot of us. I, I know most of them. Um, my honey production crops have been greatly reduced since I've had these exposure events over the last four or five years. I can directly relate it to that. I can also relate the fact that the bees are not overwintering properly. In the fall and the winter, I see them starting to die off. Uh, nationally, we're talking about 35% of bees are dying, and what we used to consider 5 to 10% loss was normal over winter. We're losing 35% on average. In my own operation, for the last two years, I've lost 65% of my operation. I operate in a part of west central Minnesota where all I see is fields of corn and soybeans. And, uh, Many of us beekeepers are, my, are, are, the big commercial guys are all migratory. We view the Midwest as our summer pasturing grounds. We come here in the summer to make a honey crop and to build the bees up over the summer. And then we go down to, to southern areas 
to build them up and do pollination work in, in, in areas like California where almonds are blooming the 1st of February. And both parts, our summer pastures and our winter pastures, have to be safe enough that we can carry on. We couldn't all just operate in little reserves. We have to be able to have the big summer pastures of the open Midwest, of the corn and soybean countries, of the row crop areas. We have to live together. And uh, currently, with the neonicotinoid seed treatment and with farmers not having the choice to plant, either treated or untreated. In Canada, they're going to offer now, as a, as a resolution, a choice of either planting treated or untreated seed. In the United States, farmers have no choice. They can only purchase treated seed for commercial varieties of field corn. So we, we have to deal with this problem, and we have to deal with it quickly. But um, the losses are, are, not, are not sustainable. 65% is not sustainable. Losing 35 to 40% of all the bees in the country, we don't have enough to pollinate the orchards in California that Marla was talking about. 800,000 acres of almonds in California, 1.6 million bees. We only have 2.2 or 3 million bees in the country. When you take off 30% of losing for overwinter, and then you take that some of those are non-migratory, like the university research ones that stay on site, or hobbyists that stay on site and don't take their bees out to pollinate, we don't have nearly enough bees to even cover the one crop in our own country. And that is a really pathetic situation to have put an industry into. And, and I have to tell almond growers the last few years, I'm unable to supply them with bees that I've known for many years. It's, it's a heart-wrenching situation to be put into. And it's devastating to the almond growers of California, which is their largest agricultural crop in California, by far. Did you have another question? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm also curious to know um, if you uh, feed your bees any supplements during the, uh, you know, when you're raising them, obviously. Uh, well, thank you. That's, a, that's another great question. Um, yes, a, a, commercial, a commercial beekeeper um, is required be, due to the nature of our moving them around to, to feed our bees from time to time. And when they've been getting sick, as they have the last five to 10 years, uh, we have to feed them more uh, and deal with them more. A sick patient requires a lot more attention, requires more medications, requires more feed, requires more. People are feeding a lot of uh, protein patties, pollen supplements, um, extra sucrose feedings, trying to stimulate and push the bees along, and give them extra advantages, take them to extra warm places, do extraordinary things to try and uh, restore, restore health to the bees. Um, uh, we work about twice as hard trying to keep sick bees going as we used to when we had healthy bees. And it, it requires a lot more management, a lot more feed, a lot more tending, a lot more care. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Ellis, then <clears throat> you said you had about 2,300 hives, is that correct? That's what I try to run. I, I fell short of that this last summer. Uh, I was unable to get up to my normal numbers because of the severe depletion from over winter. Um, many of us large commercial producers have been unable to rebuild our herds to their full capacity is what it boils down to. When you get that weakened down, you just can't build back up to your full strength. I, I got up to 2175 this summer and I shoot for 23. And, uh, when, when, a, when a commercial person who's been at this for 35 years can't even rebuild their own herd, there's something very, very wrong out there. And it, there, there is something very wrong. Thank you, Madam Chair. And can you give me a, a breakdown of how much does it cost per hive to feed all the different supplements for a year that you probably didn't have to do uh, 15 years ago or so? You know, probably two or three different uh, additional uh, sucrose or sugar feedings, um, which would be twelve, uh, three, four dollars or thirty uh, about you know, it, per hive that would be three three additional gallons, three three gallons I'd say off of what would be normal and then these protein patties, two, three rounds of them in a year, above which is normal. I, I probably spend about 
an additional twenty to thirty thousand dollars in just uh, just materials for additional food and medications that I would never normally have done. That doesn't include the labor and the extra the extra labor and time. <laughs> I've had to hire extra people to run my operation. What I used to be able to run with two people requires four now because of the extra uh, energy required to, to try to work sick bees. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then final question, do you place your hives kind of exclusively in the Barrett, Delbo Lake, Hoffman area, or how far out do you travel? Um, for for um, convenience sake, uh, we, you don't want to drive too far from where you live. Um, the furthest hive that I have from where I live in Barrett is uh, 35 miles one way to drive to it and a 70 mile round trip to go out and visit those bees. I, I, I consider that to be kind of the limit of, of what is efficient for me to be able to work on a regular basis. So I, I operate in a, in a radius, radius of about 30 miles from where I live. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, we appreciate it. Members, as I said, everything is gonna be up on the website. Uh, also on the website, we will have the laws that we passed last year, uh, and there were three different sections uh, in our omnibus bill, and right now we are going to have an update on, on uh, the statutes that we passed, and we'll start with uh, Greta Gauthier from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members, my name is Greta Gothier. I'm with the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And I'm going to try to find my PowerPoint on here. Can you help her? Okay. The date is Tuesday, May 7th, 2013. We do have copies in here, but if Bees have been moved back to Minnesota from, from California with Old Mill Honey Company in Barrett, Minnesota. Spring is just coming to Our computers over at the Department of Ag are not as up to speed as yours, I guess, or different. So at any rate, thank you for asking um, the Department of Agriculture to testify today on the activities that we've undertaken since the beginning of the fiscal year on the statutory language that was put in place. Um, just to review, our mission is to enhance Minnesotans' quality of life by ensuring the integrity of the food supply the health of the environment, and the strength of the ag economy in Minnesota. The Department of Agriculture works with farmers in many ways. Um, we have three divisions that, um, that work directly, well, all our divisions work directly with farmers, but these three are applicable for today. Um, the Pesticide and Fertilizer Management Division, which um, responds to complaints and mis on misuse <coughs> of pesticides, works in partnership with the EPA, um, we they, they work on registration of new pesticide products for use in Minnesota, um, and they conduct investigations when there's a complaint of an improper disposal or misapplication or spill of pesticides. Our plant protection division um, has a small apiary program where we do inspect bee colonies leaving Minnesota for, um, going outside the state. Also, of course, as you know, um, this division does uh, certifies a lot of our exports and um, works on other invasive species. Very small involvement with, uh, in the apiary program there. And then our ag marketing and development um, has the Minnesota Grown Program, which registers um, you know, about 1,000, 1,100 farms around the state um, and a lot of financial marketing. So there's a lot of different ways that, that we connect um, with farmers and of course in ag marketing and development, our agri program new this year. Um, provides grants for value-added ag businesses, farm to school, and next generation um, energy. So the appropriations language, just to refresh, um, for this year was in, Madam Chair, your bill, um, House File 976, um, required the department to develop ha pollinator habitat best management practices. And this was in Article 1, Section 3 of the bill. 
Also, um, in Article 2, Section 67, it requires the department to report back in January on um, three different things. Um, a proposal to establish a pollinator bank in Minnesota, a proposal to create pollinator nesting and forage refuges, and on that we are working with the DNR. And a process, uh, it also requires us to report back on what the process would be for a special registration review of um, pesticides that contain neonicotinoids. Uh, Madam Chair, there was also a requirement in this bill for DNR to do some work on pollinator habitat, but I'll let them speak to that. Um, but know that we are working together. I believe Dr. Spivak um, had a slide that showed all the agencies that are involved in the interagency team, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So we, um, you charged us to develop BMPs, and we uh, have decided to create BMPs in three different areas um, for habitat. Um, pollinator habitat. One of those will be associated with roadsides uh, because we do license pesticide applicators who do apply pesticides to township and county road rights of ways. So one set of BMPs will be for that purpose. Another one will be associated with um, what kind of BMPs can be used in primarily agricultural lands, so rural areas of the state or ex-urban. And then another set of BMPs will look at habitats associated with gardens or other managed landscapes, for example, in urban areas. So we've kind of broken it down into those three general um, areas that we will then develop a specific set of BF BMPs for roadsides, for basically rural agricultural areas, and then urban um, garden or managed landscape. Since, um, since uh, session adjourned in August of this year. I just wanted to put this up there to make sure that I highlighted it for members. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency came out with a new requirement for neonicotinoid um, and other labels dealing with, um, P, with bees. Um, so this emblem that you see here in the, the diamond with the bee, this will be required now on labels for um, products that have the potential to impact pollinators. Um, so moving forward, that will be the case. And again, we will incorporate the BMPs that we develop into our training materials for pesticide applicators and for county ag inspectors. And we did testify to that um, during the legislative session this year. So just to make folks aware that these new EPA neonicotinoid labels are pollinator labels, will help reinforce our BMPs. So uh, we also were required to do uh, an awareness campaign to try to raise public awareness on um, the issues of pollinator and um, what's happening in Minnesota. So this is the Pollinator Interagency Work Group that was established and Dr. Spivak spoke of it briefly. Um, experts recruited from various agencies, both within state government and without. So um, state agencies include the Department of Agriculture, the DNR, um, the PCA, MnDOT, Bowser, and then we've, we're also working with the USDA, Natural Resource Conservation Service, also with the University of Minnesota, University of Minnesota Extension. Um, we cast a very broad net and sent out uh, invitations and had a stakeholder meeting in November last month. We invited uh, everybody we could think of to have them come and um, talk to us about what we're doing and hopefully help us with BMPs. Um, we do have some work groups underway now for those three areas of BMPs. We have ag groups involved, we have conservation groups involved, we have um, counties, townships, um, in addition to the agencies, groups like um, we have the honey producers, the zoo, the Minnesota Association of Agricultural Aircraft, um, the Minnesota Golf Course uh, Superintendents Association, the State Horticultural Society, the Farmers Union, the Farm Bureau, corn producers, and then exam other examples would include the Nursery Landscape Association, Isaac Walton League, the Nature Conservancy, um, and I don't know if I said the honey producers, but the honey producers as well. So we've tried to capture a fairly broad group of folks that might, um, would have expertise to bring to the table 
for development of these BMPs. So that deals, that's the BMP portion. And then the other part of uh, the, in our Article 2 of the bill, we were required to, required to do these reports back. So we have done um, quite a bit of work looking at the issue of pollinator bank and working with the author of that language to determine exactly what might be feasible and what we're trying to work on in Minnesota and been in touch with other partners at the university and the zoo, et cetera. Um, so we will have that ready. Um, we have the interagency group um, working on the nesting and foraging habitat. That was the second part of the report that we're supposed to present. And the third part of the report, again, was the process, setting, reporting on what would our process be for doing a special review um, of uh, neonicotinoids. Um, at this point, I'd like to say that on that third process, we, we will re be reporting back. We already had a process in place for um, doing a special review of neonicotinoids because we had to establish that process when we did a review um, for the emerald ash borer. And one of the products that is being used to treat emerald ash borer it, uh, contains an, is a neonicotinoid, contains one. So um, rather than just report back on a process we already have, the commissioner, Commissioner Fredrickson, on November 5th, um, ordered that, uh, in, you know, ordered our staff to go ahead and initiate a special review of neonicotinoid pesticides and insect pollinators for Minnesota. So um, this report that um, we are going to be submitting back to you will actually go beyond what you have asked us to do. Um, the commissioner was um, specific in making sure that this um, review of neonicotinoids would not be redundant of work that's been done at the EPA at the federal level in this area, but that it would, um, the goal would be to characterize any um, unreasonable adverse effects. Um, there will be a public comment period in terms of the scope of that review. Um, we are working with DNR and PCA. They will be included. The commissioner specifically requested that of the staff and in that public comment scoping process. So I wanted to make you aware that, that we are um, going to go above and beyond on that third item. So kind of where we're at to, uh, to uh, wrap up, we are, um, we've got uh, an interagency core working group of state and outside agencies that's working on the BMPs, plus we have a stakeholder group that is also going to work on those BMPs. Uh, we actually have three different groups working. Um, we are drafting, we have a draft of our report already, a lot of research has gone into it, and uh, we are working on that. Um, the Commissioner of Agriculture did initiate um, a special review of neonicotinoids, and that is going to be taking place now. And um, we'll have all the details of this in our report, which is due uh, in January on the 14th. Um, so we're, we've been very active on the many fronts that you've given us to work on on this serious problem. Um, I would be happy to take questions, and uh, I think that's about all we have for today, Madam Chair. Representative Fabian has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Gauthier, for being here. Um, question on the pollinator habitat uh, best management practices. You talked about some differentiations uh, between, I think you said metro and rural Minnesota, is that correct? Madam Chair, um, gen but generally, yes. Talking more about agricultural areas, which are primarily in the more rural part of the state, and then urban areas or uh, areas where there's a more like a garden or a, that kind of a situation. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then to follow up on that, are you going to do any further uh, delineations? I'll say, I mean, obviously Minnesota is very diverse in, in its landscape between the forest area. Uh, the agriculture area around where Representative Keel lives is a lot different than the area that uh, Representative Erickson represents, and the best management practices really could be quite different. Madam Chair and Representative Fabian, thank you for that question. I would imagine that we'll be working with our state, with our groups to do that and to look at the various areas around the state. But thank Madam Chair, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, they're not, we're at the beginning stages right now. I will certainly take that back to the groups. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, that would be my suggestion. And then the uh, last thing is you talked about your stakeholder meetings that you had. Was it a meeting or meetings? Uh, 
Madam Chair and Representative Fabian, we've had one meeting so far. We had about 40 people there from a variety of groups and I can give you that information if you like. I'm, uh, I have heard discussion, although I don't think anything is etched in stone yet, that we may have another stakeholder group meeting as we move forward with this. But at this point, we have broken the stakeholders that showed interest in working with us and not all of them could attend the meeting, but they've contacted us and said they were interested. We've asked them what part of the BMPs they would like to work on. And so they've self-identified and we have three groups now of about, I think there's about 13 or 14 people in two of the groups and about 10 in the other who want to sit down and work on these BMPs and give us input into them. And may I also remember that this interagency group of both state and outside agencies will also be working on those BMPs. Representative Benson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Ms. Gauthier, maybe uh, later on we could get uh, some of these answers that I'm going to ask. So if you don't know, you know, I'd like to have a follow up if I could. Sure. We received, uh, among all these other pieces of uh, material here, these uh, regulatory agency responses to uh, neonic coated seeds. And I'm just wondering if you have a copy of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did see it. I do not have it in front of me at this moment. I left it at my chair, but I am familiar with what it said. I did read it. Okay, and we have, uh, you know, the action taken by the EU and uh, Canada, the comment, um, the quote from the U.S. Uh, EPA, and then from the Minnesota Department of uh, Agriculture. And I know it's peculiar uh, to me, it seemed. First of all, uh, is that an accurate quote from August 22nd, 2013. Madam Chair and Representative Benson, um, the best of my knowledge that is from the letter of closure to the investigation and I have not read that letter so I, I would have to get back to you to let you know if it's okay. an accurate quote. But well, we did investigate. I, I would appreciate if you do that and uh, particularly I'm uh, curious about the phraseology here. The, the observed bee mortalities may uh, fall within the EPA's acceptable boundaries of impact. Um, I, I'm curious as to how that sentence was formulated. Uh, may uh, is kind of a wiggle room word that allows uh, one could see on a first observation of it a, a department's uh, wanting to, uh, you know, escape uh, any definitive statement. And I'm curious if that was done because August 22nd uh, was simply too early that now that you've formed these working groups, uh, the department will come out with a more definitive uh, comment or observation about neonic uh, coated seeds in January. Is that something I could expect? Madam Chair and Representative Benson, um, a definitive statement on neonicotinoid coated seeds was not something that was required of the department to do. Um, so there's a couple different things going on here. First of all is the requirements that the legislature gave the department um, this year in the budget and policy bill, which we are working on. Right. The second issue from which I believe, which pertains to the quote on that piece of paper, is uh, a specific case on, on Mr. Ellis's operation where um, we saw the video just now and um, the Department of Agriculture did investigate that situation. Um, as to the reason why that sentence is worded the way it is, I don't know, I don't know offhand, Madam Chair. It's out of context and as you may know, these letters, we are bound by um, rules and requirements from the EPA um, so we operate under federal law, as you know. Um, we, so I'm not sure why it was stated that way. Um, we did find um, some levels of pesticides on the LSBs, I am told, but we were unable to prove um, because the concentrations found on the bees were too low to cause these large bee deaths and evaluations were based on the average amount of contamination that would be, a bee would be consuming versus those that we found on the LSBs. Um, so I can give you a lot more detail, but at the bottom line, the Environmental Protection Agency does not assume a zero bee mortality from pesticides. 
Well, Madam so Chair, we if I may, thank you for that. Within those constraints. Uh, I'm just wondering if you might know, uh, Ms. Gauthier, uh, what the date of publication of the uh, quote from the U.S. EPA might be. Is that something as recent as August 2013, would you know? Or is that something from five, ten years ago? Madam Chair, um, Representative Benson, for the EPA quote, I, excuse me, I thought you meant the MDA quote. For the EPA quote, I do not know the time frame of that. I'm sorry. I would have to um, research that and get back to you. I appreciate that. I think that's yep. important. You know, this uh, issue is becoming more and more significant. The last comment, and I, you know, I, you just happen to be the, the person testifying today, <laughs> but if you can assist me with it, I'd appreciate it. And that is the comment that the uh, B mortalities, and we just heard from Mr. Ellis that he has witnessing mort mortalities of 35 to 65 percent. And I'm curious why the uh, Minnesota Department of Agriculture would consider that an acceptable boundary of impact. Uh, Madam Chair, um, <clears throat> I would have to probably get back to you with um, that as a closed case so we can, um, the information from that case is public, but I would have to get back to you with the letter, um, the complete letter that was sent to Mr. Ellis. I don't have that with me um, and that would probably outline in more detail why the department acted as it did. Madam Chair, just one last, just kind of a question. Um, the way, um, the introduction of uh, chemicals, and I've understood as many as 75,000 new uh, compounds are introduced into the environment on average every single year. Um, and we know that uh, in the European uh, Union, companies uh, are not allowed to introduce new chemical compounds into the environment until they've been proven to be acceptable or safe, whereas in the United States, it's been the tradition we simply uh, allow uh, companies to introduce these compounds into the environment and then if people complain or we find problems, then we have a follow-up. I'm just curious whether the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has ever thought of um, championing a different uh, uh, direction for the United States or at least for the state of Minnesota on the introduction of these uh, untested or chemicals compounds that are tested by the manufacturers and not by an independent agency, which has led, in my opinion, to many of these problems. I think that would be an excellent question to respond to when you come back with your review. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we are going to have another opportunity. Uh, and we'll, we'll make sure that that's available because we are going to have uh, I just don't know the timing yet, but we will definitely uh, have a, a, not only a, we'll have a further update on this. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to mention that because lots of times we have the notion uh, that all these uh, decisions should be made at the federal level. Uh, I've always felt the local governments and states can have an impact on this. And if a state like Minnesota began to uh, challenge that long-held uh, practice, it might be useful. I think that's, a, as you do your review, that's a comment uh, to keep in mind because we'll hear it back. Uh, Representative Anderson, just one more quick question. We have, we have one, more, two more things to do, so we want to make sure we, everybody gets heard. Oh, just a quick question, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Gauthier, maybe you don't have the answer to this, but uh, that new EPA uh, label that came out uh, in August, did it have any new regulations on it, or what, what did the label do? <clears throat> Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, um, I d am not the person to answer that question. I apologize. I'm not sure. I have some staff in the audience here, but I'm not sure if they're the right we ones to talk about that. So I'd have probably better off getting that to you. I, th I think it's, that can be part of what we do in our next hearing on this subject because this is not the last hearing. So we will make sure that that's one of the follow-ups. All right, thank you so much, I appreciate it.
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we we have uh, Bob Welch from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources who's going to talk about, and I see you have an extra handout, so we'll get those out around to folks. On, uh, from uh, LCCMR should be relatively quick members uh, I would like to ask if there's anybody in the audience who's planning on testifying no. I don't see any right what? now members wait excuse me oh, oh yes if you're planning that's fine we're just I just want to make sure that uh, members have that in mind how long we're going to be going that's fine. Yes, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Bob Welsh. I'm with the Department of Natural Resources, Division of Fish and Wildlife, and I am the uh, Section of Wildlife Habitat Program Manager. Um, I'm going to be very brief um, here this afternoon, and I think people are anxious to, uh, uh, to get going. So, um, as Ms. As Ms. Gaithier mentioned, um, we, uh, I am here reporting on um, language from the same uh, legislative uh, bill, uh, specifically Article 4 for the Department of Natural Resources, Section 12. Um, here to just uh, report on progress and implementing the, uh, uh, the habitat, uh, our pollinator habitat program as directed in this legislation. Uh, this legislation was really directed at um, the management that the Department of Natural Resources done on, does on its lands and with its uh, uh, funding. And so the first thing that we did was uh, uh, develop a, a process to, uh, to satisfy this legislation. We assembled a team, uh, a team of about uh, uh, eight to ten individuals uh, across, across the disciplines. And uh, the first thing we did was study the, uh, the language and um, define a project, uh, define the project and, uh, uh, and, and its scope. Um, the major product uh, that is to come out of that uh, process is the development of best management practices, <coughs> excuse me, best management practices and uh, restoration guidelines um, for uh, native plant communities. And then finally, uh, that, that product will be taken to, uh, uh, through a review process and finally implemented. Uh, to remind everyone of, of, the, of the language, this is the, uh, the language from that bill. And the first thing we did was to uh, define some of the, uh, the key terms so that uh, we could be comfortable with the scope of the project. Uh, those are in blue, and I will address those uh, uh, in uh, the following slides. Uh, first of all, best management practices. I think we're all familiar with best management practices, but the, uh, these are, are, are really directed at the management activities that we perform um, while in the field, so treatments, if you will. And then uh, habitat restoration. Um, uh, this term is directed at uh, reconstruction efforts based on native plant communities and uh, paying special attention to the expected pollinators that are, uh, that are present in those native plant communities and the floral resources, um, uh, the floral resource availability for those pollinators. Uh, lands under the control of the commissioner was a, is, a, is a term that was used in there, and we define that as all lands managed by, uh, primarily by the uh, four uh, land managing divisions within the department, and those are uh, the Fish and Wildlife Division, uh, Eco Waters and Resources Division, um, Parks and Trails Division, and the Forestry Division. And this does include uh, fee title lands, um, easements, and, uh, and leases. The prairie restoration portion of the, uh, of the section goes a little bit further. Uh, in addition to state lands, it, uh, it also applies to 
um, prairie restorations, the BMPs and, and guidelines um, apply to um, restorations using state funds. And um, state funds we defined as any funds directly appropriated to or through the Department of Natural Resources. So that includes uh, direct annual appropriations of the myriad of, of funding sources that we have within the department, uh, bonding funds, uh, grants to or from the department, and uh, 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 our interpretation is that this includes LCCMR funds and uh, outdoor heritage funds. Um, and then that this would also, uh, for prairie work, uh, would include um, work with our partners um, using funds that are administered by the department. And then finally, uh, it does reference uh, appropriate diversity in, in restorations. Um, this is a little bit trickier uh, to, to define and uh, we're putting uh, great efforts in, in defining that because it's not only a diversity in numbers of species but also, uh, also across time. And uh, we're quite confident that this is, this is in from, uh, knowledge that we're gonna learn uh, a great deal in the, in, the, in the coming years with some of the, the great work that's being done that you heard about um, earlier. A little bit about the BMPs and guidelines. Those are, um, are in process. Best management practices. Um, we, we broke our broader team into sub teams to really kind of uh, 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 divide and conquer, if you will. We had a sub team uh, looking at best management practices. And this team is developing practices associated with common habitat management treatments um, that we do on our lands and designing some of these uh, practices to, uh, to, to, to benefit pollinators. Um, these will include guidance to managers on things like some of the things you see here, surveying and, in, in, and inventorying, knowing what's there before you start and, and monitoring how that changes uh, 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 post-treatment. Uh, prescribed fire, um, timing, um, uh, providing for skips, things like that. Um, mowing and haying, um, timing and, uh, uh, and, and uh, um, getting the uh, optimal uh, diversity out of treatments, uh, grazing, use of pesticides, timber harvest, forest management activities. So basically uh, 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 l little, little tips and um, things to adhere to as these activities are, are occurring in the field in order to, uh, uh, to benefit uh, pollinators. Restoration guidelines. Uh, the sub team that worked on restoration guidelines is uh, developing direction to land managers on restoring sites to the, the appropriate native plant community that would be expected on that site based on its location in the landscape, soils, hydrology, etc. Uh, this guidance will include lists of plant species uh, beneficial to pollinators by the community to aid managers in a seed mix selection. And uh, uh, so, so that list is being um, uh, developed as we speak and it's gonna be, it's gonna look at again, uh, diversity of species um, uh, across species themselves and then across time as, as well. And uh, many of the species uh, um, that you heard uh, earlier uh, from, from Elaine, um, uh, as you might imagine, uh, might expect are, are, uh, uh, are expected to be on that list. So how are we doing? Current progress, the BMPs and guidelines document is, is nearly complete. In fact, I expect it to, uh, to be complete in its uh, first draft um, sometime this week, uh, certainly by the end of the week. Um, and then we will be initial, initiating a review process, uh, first uh, uh, an internal review process, um, and then going external, engaging st uh, stakeholders and, par uh, and partners in, in the coming weeks. Um, really would like to have this document uh, finalized with all uh, review um, by the end of February um, at, the, at the latest, perhaps into March, and ready for um, implementation in the, uh, in the coming field season. And that's really all I had, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks for the update. Any questions for members? Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, would these seed 
packages, would they be kind of uh, required for wetland mitigation if, uh, for instance, uh, there's going to be some upland and some wetlands in, uh, if you're going to convert farmland into wetland credit or so on, would these seeds be then part of a mandatory thing that um, uh, the wetland people or would have to do? Um, that's, that's a really good question. I think it really, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, I, I think that really depends on the, um, on the source of the funding and the, um, and, and, and the land. Um, the, uh, the best management practices and the restoration guidelines are, uh, are required on state lands and lands administered by the department. So if it were an easement, for example, that we hold, um, then yes, we would, we would hold the, uh, the contractor or, or if we're in, in the case we're contracting uh, or the grantee, uh, if it's a case of, uh, of a grant. Uh, using state funds, um, then we we would hold um, the the entity to those best management practices and restoration guidelines. Did I get at your question? No, Madam Chair. Um, no, not really. Um, the situation in my county is uh, the mines are trying to mitigate wetland acres, and they're taking 640 acres of cropland and they're turning it into. Um, upland game and whatever wetlands they can get out of it. And I'm just wondering if uh, those people would be, especially for the upland areas, um, have some kind of a seed package that they would be required to uh, plant it in for pollinators, for um, native grasses or, or whatever it would become. I guess, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I guess I don't really know the answer to that question. I mean, our, our best management practices and restoration guidelines as directed in the legislation are directed at lands that we control and funds that we administer. So the, the, uh, in, in your case, it sounds like it's private property owner and uh, I mean, we're, we're more than happy to, to share um, those those lists and restoration guidelines and best management practices. Um, I, I I guess I I don't understand how that uh, this particular legislation would would hold them to that. I think that's correct. Okay, thank you for your test. Oh, thank you for your testimony. We'll next hear from uh, Susan Thornton, who is uh, with. Uh, the LCCMR and the LCCMR just completed uh, its recommendations and uh, or the package of recommendations and in that were uh, probably a half a dozen things uh, related to pollinators and so if you would like to help us out there. Um, thank you Madam Chair and members. My name is Susan Thornton. I'm the director of the Legislative Citizen Commission, Minnesota Resources, LCCMR. We make funding recommendations to you, the legislature, from the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, which comes from the state lottery dollars. In your packet is a one-page handout that looks like this. It's got the Environmental Trust Fund logo um, at the top of it. What? And brief, very briefly, Madam Chair and members, there will be $29 million being recommended by the commission to the legislature from the Environment and Natural Resource Trust Fund projects this year. And there will be 72 appropriations. Of those appropriations, um, and there's a little typo in here, there are, uh, in addition to the restoration habitat projects, there are um, six appropriations totaling approximately $2,225,000 specifically to the issue of pollinators. And these, this funding, if approved by the legislature and signed by the governor, will begin July 1, 2014. The whole suite of recommendations will be presented and going through this committee. I'm available down in room 65 to meet with any of you individually uh, on the recommendations. The, um, you've heard about many of those projects already today. 
Uh, in, there is one titled Enhancing Pollinator Landscapes recommended to the U of M for $864,000. This appropriation is being led by Dr. Marla Spivak and it will identify the sources of nectar and pollen for native pollinators and honeybees. And this will provide that overall coordinating structure that everybody's been talking about today. And to enhance the pollinator habitat and really look at what our future opportunities, needs in research and pollinator nesting and foraging. A second appropriation uh, Eric Runquist spoke about, it's called imperiled imperiled prairie butterfly conservation research and breeding project and that's a joint project with the uh, Minnesota Zoological Garden and the Department of Natural Resources that's being recommended at $625,000. This is one of the items that Representative Kahn asked about and this will be looking specifically at the um, Powashik skipperling and the Dakota skipper and uh, a breeding effort for that. And then we'll also be looking at broader monitoring and surveying, looking at the results, a genetic research program, um, and also the causes of mortality, and then targeted outreach to the public on the efforts taking place. The third is Dr. Uh, Vera Krishik that you've spoken with her about, understanding systemic insecticides as a protection strategy for bees. This is a second appropriation to Dr. Krishik. The first one was, I believe, in 2010 that really did this neonicotinoid analysis in greenhouses. This will be out field testing and to, uh, for the looking at the impact on native bees and honey bee colonies by these insecticides. The fourth one is titled Wild Bee Pollinator Surveys in Prairie and Grassland Habitat. This is being led by the Department of Natural Resources. It's being recommended for $370,000. And this is a team effort really being led by DNR and it includes amongst other entities, the U of M, the Science Museum of Minnesota, the Xerxes Society and the Nature Conservancy. And this is to be able to go out in our prairies and our grasslands and really uh, do the, the survey work needed and measuring the difference in the bee fauna documented from prairies in the past to those found in prairies and grasslands today. Uh, another one is the, is the Pollinator Education Center at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. That's being recommended at $615,000. And this is a new educational exhibit uh, and doing outreach uh, to, uh, to the public and to our uh, schools. And then another one that is not on here is with Pheasants Forever, and that's for $100,000, and that will be doing outreach and small community pollinator projects within those various communities with various Pheasants Forever chapters. And then also on your handout, I wanna call your attention to uh, an appropriation being led by Dr. Marla Spivak that was appropriated in the 2013 legislative session. And this is what's called the Bee Friendly Lawns is the more colloquial term. And it's really what are some opportunities in lieu of traditional turf grass that can be done to enhance bee pollinator habitat. And that's a very short version very quickly because I'm cognizant of the time, Madam Chair. Well, members, of course, you're going to be yeah. hearing this in committee when it comes through uh, during the beginning of session. Uh, but any questions right now? Yes. Oops, this is actually a little bit off the topic, but looking at the enhancing of pollinators, what can we do about stopping the MnDOT mowing? I think that will come if the Department of Agriculture is looking at that particular thing and will be reporting to us on that uh, when they do their final uh, presentation, which will come, but we, we will hear. I, I had always thought it was just that the only problem was just the waste of money of doing that. But, um, you know, now that we know there's also some beneficial aspects to leaving to making sure that pollinators are growing along and it's another reason. 
I, my buddy over there is. I would. <laughs> like, like he has something to say. Yes. <laughs> Representative McNamara. Well, well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Connolly, I see Mendot is still here. Representative Connolly, I would love to co-author a bill with you to uh, get them to mow less. It Ooh. would save them a lot of diesel fuel. It would save butterflies, monarchs, pheasants, all kinds of stuff. They do need to mow okay. for some safety reasons, well, but yes, they, they mow way but, too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, I'm, I'm volunteering as the third author. To see <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, okay, yeah. we have some co-authors here. I think. Okay, you, we'll get the whole. You get it. Be a committee bill. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Just, uh, I, I did actually have a conversation about this with the director uh, not too long ago, and because I had a constituent who was particularly concerned, he is a beekeeper, oh. and uh, talking about the distance that bees can fly, and that he's really concerned about the mowing that uh, that transportation does. Uh, the comment was you know, give me a specific location and we'll see what we can do about it. But we also have complaints about noxious weeds. So, you know, somehow we need to do some balancing in here. I'm, I'm wanting to sign on to that bill too, but there are other issues that we need to consider. Okay. Well, the only way to really take care of noxious weeds is to make sure you have something in their place. Yes. Okay. Well, Representative Wuginius, obviously, if this is an unsession, unmowing is a great thing for an unsession. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have two very quick last things, then we're going to have public testimony. Representative Fabian. Did you I'm not a co-author on the bill. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Chair. I live on a mile long driveway and I have some clover that's grown in my road ditch. And I try to burn my road ditches in the fall. I pull over with a big stem, doesn't burn. And I have a mess with drifting snow already. So there are some, as you mentioned, trade offs with not keeping our ditches somewhat trimmed. And out in the open prairies, you're asking for a lot of trouble if you don't uh, get that stuff down on the ditches. So I would just, uh, just add that. Live in the city. I would just like to point out that I second that and I agree with Fabian. I'm not on that bill because we have to have conversation about the other effects in the rural area where the prairie is flat. I, I think one of the things that will come up with that discussion is the, as I look at Highway 27 and they mowed down all the prairie plantings in August. That was an inappropriate time, and maybe we are, we're not talking about appropriate times here. So, with that, thank you, thank you and uh, we will now hear public testimony. Patricia Hauer, Hauser. Of course. Yes. Thank you for coming. Please put say your name on the record, if you would. Patricia Hauser, I'm from Shorewood. Uh, I'm kind of new at this. This is my first testimony, and I don't even like speaking in public, and I don't like driving on the roads. But I know you guys have been sitting here a long time, and I really appreciate that you're going to have some patience and, for me and a little attention. Thanks. I'm here as a concerned public citizen. I represent my neighbors, friends, and regular person off the street and yourselves who care about the bees, the butterflies, and all the pollinators that are responsible for every third bite of food or drink that we take. I thank you for allowing me to speak today on this really important issue and for having these other wonderful speakers. I am very impressed with what's happening at the University of Minnesota and all the other places and uh, am so glad that we have that available for us. I came speaking, silly me, I came speaking uh, here because I thought what if no one talks about neonicotinoids and I just learned how to say that word after about three weeks of practice <laughs> but I was really concerned and I I still am after hearing more about it I want to just start out by saying I know you've heard it but what are neonicotinoids we already know that what nicotine is so if you think of it uh, how nicotine harms and kills humans, it's really no surprise that it's also toxic to insects. Uh, Neonicotinoid pestinoids, pesticides, are nicotine-like chemicals that act on the nervous system of insects 
with a lower threat to us mammals and the environment um, uh, than many older sprays. Uh, pesticides made in this way are water soluble, as you've heard, which means they can be applied to the soil and taken up by the pole plant. They're called systemic. What they do is they turn the plant into a poison factory with toxins coming from the roots, the steves, the limb, stems, and the pollen. So, whoops, I forgot the leaves. Roots, leaves, stems, and pollen. And the nicotinoids are often applied as seed treatments, as you've been talking about, which means coating the seeds before planting. Then we've heard about the damage that's doing. Uh, as of nine days ago, that was December 1st, uh, the European Union put a ban on neonicotinoids. neonicotinoids. Cloth now this I'm really going to murder. Clothidian, imidacloprid, thiamethaxam. Anyway, those three uh, for a period of two years. It came about because the European Food Safety Authority said these substances pose acute risk to honeybees, which are essential to farming and natural ecosystems. They examined the modes of contamination that had been overlooked when the neonicotinoids were first approved for sale. Uh, according to Greenpeace, France and Italy already restricted the use of neonicotinoids. So they've already done it for a little bit of time. And there's been no significant impacts on agricultural production from what I've been reading. Uh, what we found out what they were doing in China, in the uh, Maoxian County of Sichuan, China, an area that lost its pollinators through the indiscriminate use of pesticides and the overharvesting of the bees' honey, uh, they are now pollinating their pear and apple trees by hand. And what are we doing in the United States? Well, I went on. <coughs> One of the things is that the new EPA advisory uh, uh, strengthened pesticides label to protect pollinators. We've put out a label. Good grief. Uh, it's, you know, it's good to have that. It says this product can kill bees and other insect pollinators, but that seems really next to what other countries are doing and what's really seriously happening to our food system and our insects. We're doing a label? Okay. Uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, August 13th, 2013, Emma Alberti was the presenter. And she said, Albert Einstein said that if bees become extinct, the hum human race was only going to have a few years to live because of the threat of the food supply. Now, honeybees worldwide are dying at unprecedented rates. <coughs> I think it's time for Minnesota to step up to the late plate and not be any later than we are and be a leader for bees and our pollinators. My request to you is to please do everything you can to protect our pollinators, to keep the money coming to support these groups that are doing the research and that are standing up and saying what needs to be said. I learned some things today, so I'm also going to request that when the funding, as you make decisions about funding, that you can you know, stop the mowing and spraying of the roadsides and use that funding to plant, that you save and extra funding that you have to plant that clover that was talked about. The other thing that was really important that I heard today was about public pesticide records put some funding into the public pesticide records so that we can have information that will serve us in making our decisions. Um, oh, also, I would appreciate, I don't know if this was mentioned, I didn't recall it, but I might have stepped out at that time. Put some funding into starting the process of making sure that the public know and the greenhouses know which plants are sprayed with neonicotinoids so we don't take them home and plant them in our gardens thinking we're doing a great thing and instead, you know, uh, killing our own pollinators. I talked to our local garden center uh, in Shorewood and the woman wasn't able to be here, who's in charge there, but she said she's very concerned and she personally is going to phase out the neonicotinoids on her shelf 
by next year and it's but she needs to know what else she can do offer to her clients um, I also love the idea that I just heard from the woman who spoke last about uh, having money I mean having some legislation maybe you can I don't know if you can do anything in this, as appropriation committee but we need to ha we do need to have it's common sense to have safety from corporations their research has to have safety in it before we're spraying all these chemicals ahead of time and they should foot the bill not causing you know having us pay for it afterwards and trying to fix up their mistakes you have a lot of information today thank you for not sleeping through it I, I watched <laughs> and you paid attention it's really important do keep studying this know it so that education is not the issue we have great resources right here in Minnesota to get the issues um, so I wonder what the I hope the real issue isn't going to be self delusion or procrastination because it is so urgent and so I guess I'll just end with uh, the words of uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Chris Hedges uh, my own words would be don't be afraid to stand up to the corporations uh, allowing corporations here's Chris Hedges allowing corporations to dictate our relation to to the environment is a form of collective insanity another way to say it would be allowing corporations to dictate our relationship to bees butterflies and other pollinators is a form of collective suicide that's what I think as a public citizen and some of my many of my friends and relatives agree so thank you for your time thank you for your testimony are there questions for our testifier I don't see any thank you very much is there anyone else here who would like to testify I don't see anyone else um, you do have reimbursement sheets in your packets members I want to thank Mary Faust and Lynn Sando for helping us helping us out today with paging and with that members I will tell you that we will have a hearing in January on air quality in the metro area and Rochester and we will do some work also on waste management uh, recycling probably scheduled as back-to-back -back hearings uh, oh we've got it January 14th and 15th uh, and we will have updates on things that uh, we need to have updates on just as we had today we will continue uh, with updates on statutes representative Torkelson well, thank you madam chair uh, the speaker announced uh, some time ago that we were gonna have hearings the last week of January we will be doing that yes we will be doing that also yes we have lots of work to do really so will that week we'll be meeting at our regularly scheduled times according to the schedule that we've been at using during session yes thank you Representative McNamara. thank you madam chair are they going to be regular committee meetings are they going to be working groups uh, we're going to have regular committees both the dates you mentioned and the entire week the speaker or the four day week the speaker mentioned I I can't speak for the speaker I can only tell you that we are planning to do hearings in our regular time slot um, so I, I don't know what other folks are going to be doing hmm? we're all supposed to be doing that okay so madam chair we'll have um, is it at least four regular hearings it sounds like then because we normally only met twice a week um, so the week the speaker mentioned we'll meet at our regular times twice that week and then we'll have two hearing a hearing on both the 14th and the 15th yes and they will be will they be like a half day hearing uh, I think so okay Pro back to back two two big subjects so we'll do them back to back madam chair if I may would it be like one the first one be in the afternoon second one in the morning yes uh, pro, thank you so we can make their traveling accommodate traveling times yes. okay thank you with that there's no further business and this meeting is adjourned